Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 554 Happy Anniversary. This episode of Craft Lit is brought to you. By you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am in shock. Yes, we have actually and in fact passed the two Craftlet 15 year anniversaries. There's the I got the idea, I was crazy to have the idea, and I recorded the first episode anniversary. And then there's the and I released it to the world anniversary. And everything changed in life for me when I did that in such wonderful and good ways. I am reminded of this every time I manage in the last couple of months to show up for our Zoom chats on Tuesday mornings, Eastern time, and Thursday nights, Eastern time. And anytime I get a spare second to look at Facebook, I, I have to confess one of the things that having a job job has done to me is it really has kept me off of social media. And as much as I love seeing things from you guys, which I do, I can't say I miss the pressure of social media in general. Yeah, I can't say I miss it. I've been painting more, drawing more, taking online classes more on those things. And I don't know if I'm seeing improvement, but between ripping paper and scribbling colors in places and splashing colors in places, it's not a bad thing. Even if I'm not getting any better, it's pretty colors. And, you know, in a time like this, that's just great, I think. <laughs> if, that's, if that's all you can handle is listening to audiobooks and, <laughs> and tearing paper and slapping pretty colors down, then that's fine. Oh, and getting rid of stuff in the basement. I will be making the second run to the thrift store tomorrow to drop things off, <laughs> not pick things up. Although I am going to be running by the hardware store to get more storage items. But aside from that, that's a different thing. Not just storage, organizational storage items. I'm figuring out how this family needs to have things organized, finally. <laughs> finally. It only took me 25 years. That's all. Because yeah, this is 15, 15 for Craftlet and 25 for Andrew and me this year, this October. I know that's not for nothing. And aside from those things, honestly, there hasn't been anything else this week. I mean, there's always work, which is fascinating. It's really the first time, the last couple of months are really the first time that I've had a large group of people to work with who I'm, I guess, sort of de facto managing. And it's been spectacular because they're awesome. You know, creative, thoughtful, supportive of each other and thoughtful, like full of thought. They think things, big things and good things. It's kind of like if you get a whole bunch of people in one job space who all want to make the world a better place. It's just kind of cool because you get a lot of really awesome people in that situation. And I love that. So lots and lots of good on that front, even if the, the rest of the world is struggling and having a hard time. It is, except for New Zealand and Australia, because y'all rock. But it is nice to be able to every day see proof that the, the world is actually full of lovely, wonderful people. And on that note, it's time for us to get into Northanger Abbey. So last week we finished the official volume one. This saw the, the end of what would have been the first bound volume of the story. Now, one of the things that I've, I've started noticing about the copies of books that we have had 
that indicate where those volumes were, like according to some versions of the book or according to online digitized copies of the books. We're about to do chapters 16 and 17 today. According to one of the annotated copies I have, this is volume two, chapter one and chapter two. Whenever we've had a copy of a book that does that, that definitely makes that split between volumes, one of the things that I've noticed is that much like TV show scripts where they have to write in where the commercial breaks will be for American shows, because number one, if they're written for commercial television, there will be commercial breaks. And number two, even if they aren't necessarily written for television because of syndication and things like that, writers tended to be aware where the the rhythm of those breaks would happen. And even back in the day, and if you didn't see it, Maya Daguerre posted a link for something that's happening tomorrow. So I'm, af I'm afraid this will only be useful for people who listen in real time. But tomorrow there's going to be a talk given by the Jane Austen Society in the UK about how Jane Austen reinvented the novel. And I am so excited to get a chance to listen to this because yes, and I can't wait to learn more on that topic. But along with perhaps reinventing the novel, as they will teach us tomorrow, she also, by the time she finished Northanger Abbey, second to last book she ever finished in her short life, she really knew her business. Because here at the volume break, which is roughly halfway through the book, you know, pretty, pretty darn close, they would have divided it mostly based on text length, the actual number of pages the book was taking up. But also they were going to have to cut it at a, a chapter break and then number the, the chapters accordingly. Not for nothing, everything shifts at this point in the text. Sometimes shifts like that are not necessarily good for either the reader or for the characters. In the situation that we're in this time, it's it's not a bad shift, but it is a fascinating one because the the first half of the book has really included an awful lot of Jane Austen breaking in in kind of a dear reader sort of Miss Manners style where she is instructing us what we should be recognizing in society. It's one of the ways that she's able to satirize the foibles of the way that society has uh, constructed itself in Bath around the pump room and around these these dances and the book that you get to look in to see who's in town that week and all of all of these bits and pieces. Jane was was able to uh, pop her own commentary in to give us her raised eyebrow and wink, and that's fun. But part of what she was doing in that situation was making sure we knew where the chessboard was, who's on the chessboard, what are the rules of that chessboard, because now we're going to change the chessboard. And these, these first two chapters that appeared in volume two are the, oh, so this is what's happening now, parts of the story. And some stories, that's a shift for the better. Some stories shift for the not so much better. And here it's, a uh, well, it could be either, depending on what you like best about Jane Austen. I personally get such a huge kick out of her comments in the first half of the book that this shift was actually kind of difficult for me the first time I read it. Since then, since reading it several times now, I no longer have problems with this shift. It is a heads up for you, though, that if you feel saddened at first by the shift we are about to encounter, please don't. We will continue to have wonderfully wry moments, but instead of them being Jane Austen winking at us over a cup of tea and time across the years, instead what we get to do is enjoy the fact that we now know enough about how Catherine works and enough about how Jane works that she can pull herself back a bit 
and instead just pay attention to being a really good writer because now the the satire and the the comedy shifts from this kind of overt impossible to miss speechifying that we got from Jane into her writing Catherine into situations where Catherine's behavior is Jane's commentary. Now, Jane, Jane has written Catherine to be 17 years old, which we know. Her brother's 20. There are two children in between them, so not for nothing. That house was crowded and crowded with a lot of the same age children. And so Catherine's commentary is on teaching children how to read <laughs> and history. <laughs> We knew before, but it is absolutely true. Those had to have been hard-won lessons that she learned. As a 17-year-old a girl who's, who has largely been out of public life her entire 17 years and has only really just begun to experience new people at all, when you figure that the Allens were really the only people she had to go visit, uh, it's a, rather amazing that she is as socialized as she is. It says a lot about her, her parents and the Allens that they were able to prepare her enough for society from her, her countrified living as they were able to. But we, we have somebody who's a, an innocent when it comes to the world, an innocent in the machinations and manipulations that one could encounter in society, which we've certainly seen evidence of here, but we've also seen evidence of in so many of the books that we've read. But she's also and innocent in her ability to be honest. And I mean, kind of flatly honest. If she doesn't understand something that you say, Catherine is very likely to say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Not feeling guilty for not understanding, not feeling embarrassed for not understanding, not feeling irked that you have said something that she didn't understand, but just quite honestly, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. And that's a refreshing character. It's also a really hard character to write well and not allow them to start to look stupid because Catherine's not stupid and she does learn. And we have seen her slowly realize and then admit that she doesn't much like James or his behavior, but she also can't quite parse it because she knows her brother's a good person. And if James is his friend, then there is some cognitive dissonance going on. And she hasn't quite figured out how to calculate that, how to, how to file that information away. And I can respect that. That's a, a complicated and uncomfortable position to be in. She has started to see things in Isabella that she also isn't completely okay with. But again, her brother clearly cares about Isabella and she trusts her brother. So that's more of a challenge. We know that her brother has gone home to find out if his father will, their, their father will support him in marrying Isabella. And we find out how that comes out today. And we also find out how Catherine is feeling about all of that a little bit today. There are a few things to know before we start some of the two chapters that we have today have have language being used in interesting ways that we haven't really seen yet in the book so i i am going to go ahead and explain those like i usually do but there are some items that i actually am going to hold back on and not explain until after we've listened to the chapter this week as well just because i don't want to risk spoiling surprises and things like that for you. All right. So first thing is we've talked about dancing sets and how you have the two lines of people and a couple uh, girl side and a gentleman side for the dance and the gentleman and the lady meet up in the middle and then do the dance down the lines of people and then position themselves at the bottom of the line to move up through the line as the dance continues. A long set would not be describing the amount of time the song went on for. A long set would be how many people there are in line. So a short set would be if there were fewer people in line. Now, a long set would be lovely if you like the person you're dancing with because it would give you more opportunity to talk and 
that's great. A short set would be lovely if you didn't much like the person that you're talking to, because it won't last as long and there will be less time for you to talk. You'll hear the phrase, preparing to give them hands across. This is a dance maneuver. You have seen it in every Regency movie you have ever seen. Creating a square, two men, two women. Uh, the men would be next to each other. The women would be next to each other. So if you were looking at the square from the top, you would have, say, two women at the upper left and upper right position, two men at the lower left, lower right position. And hands across would be the man in the lower right reaches across, hands across, to the woman in the upper left. So diagonally, the gentleman in the lower left would reach across, hands across, to the woman in the upper right. They would then do some kind of dance maneuver clockwise, and then they would switch hands and do it anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. I believe when I was at Oxford, we were taught, I want to say it was a minuet, and this reminds me an awful lot of that because there's only so much you can do if your hands are engaged across a very small space. You know, only your arm's length is separating you from anyone at that point. There's not a whole lot of dance maneuvers that you can break into at that point. I do remember that the, if it was a minuet that we learned, it was relentless on our calves because the dance maneuver that was required of us was all switching between walking like a normal person and then elevating yourself onto your toes and continuing to walk only on your toes and then lowering yourself to being flat foot and then lifting yourself again. So there was a lot of this lift, lower, lift, lower, lift, lower, and boy, did our calves hurt that night after we had practiced that. It was a lot. So I, I wonder if it was a minuet. I absolutely do not recall what the, the dance name was, but I do believe it was Regency-era-ish Regency dance because I remember the way that she was describing the way that the women needed to stand. And you know, the, the dresses at this time, along with the ampere waist and the short sleeves, you would of, often have during the day, a uh, sheer or sheer cotton or sheer muslin, sometimes kind of lacy, almost a, a dicky, like a, a fake collar. It would just be the no sleeves. It would just be a collar and fabric that would cover your chest and a little bit of your your back, and then you'd put your dress on over that. So it wouldn't um, it wouldn't add bulk to your bodice. And then, of course for evening time, you wouldn't want to wear something like that. You would want your skin showing. And as we saw in Bridgerton, lots of skin sh could show <laughs> depending on who was in the room with you. But you'd have those lovely neoclassical scooped necks. Well, you're still wearing some kind of corsetry for support. And as we have learned from Craftlet listeners over the years and from Bernadette Banner and Abby Cox, and all these YouTubers who do wonderful, wonderful instructional videos on these things. Unlike my experience, my personal experience with a corset, they didn't have to be implements of torture. Instead, they could be actually made to fit your body and support your body. And in cases like what I'm going towards, maneuver your body into a shape that made a particular style of dress look particularly good on you. One of the ways that they, uh, that the corsets of the time would have done that here is they would have functioned kind of like a push-up bra. And this was one of the things that we were taught in, in the class at Oxford. This is ridiculous that I remember this. Part of the reason that the dance we were learning was choreographed the way it was and the stateliness of the dance as far as your footwork went was because one of the things that the women were supposed to be showing off was their excellent posture and their lovely bosom. Not particularly low-cut dresses at the time, but just that kind of neoclassical, hey, look, the human form is gorgeous kind of thing. And uh, I was intensely uncomfortable about that at the time. Now I kind of look back and I laugh at myself, but at the time I found it very challenging. And it wasn't just because my calves hurt. 
<laughs> I was incredibly intensely modest. And then, you know, go, you go through childbirth later in life and that just goes out the window because people just walk into the room and you are in various states of undress giving birth. And that's just, that's just the end of that part of your life. So <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So that was hands across, everybody. <laughs> okay. So we get into some technical stuff about Mr. Moreland. Mr. Moreland is a clergyman. His son, Catherine's older brother, is studying and will likely be a clergyman as well. So Mr. Moreland is going to be identified as patron and incumbent of his fortune. This means he is both the person holding that living, in this case, a, a clerical position. So he would have been like uh, Patrick Bronte, but he also is the patron. And that means he has the right to appoint the next person to hold that living. And he has the power to do this, which is something that Patrick Bronte never had and caused enormous difficulty for the family because of that, especially early on in their tenure in Haworth. Okay, so back to the Morelands. We also heard early in the book that Mr. Moreland had two livings, two incomes. So one of them, he would be able to pass on to his son James as a clerical position when James is able to take that up when he's 22 or 23. He's currently 20. Then there's a, another living that he can pass on to James, and that would be part of the estate as a future inheritance. That would be when his father passes away he would inherit money. We do come across the word niggardly again, which, as we have talked about before on the podcast, is not derived from the slur that we unfortunately hear far more often than, than this particular term. But again, we, we know that the epithet version is derived from a Latin root that then went into Portuguese and French, and it was a word for, for dark. In this case, the word has roots in Old Norse, and then it moves into Middle English. It comes from the Old Norse word for stingy, and that is where we get a similar sounding word, but a very different meaning word, which is used here by Jane Austen. And yes, I do love having an OED on my desk, even if it's almost as old as I am. <laughs> not the latest edition, not going to have any words around the internet or anything Stephen Colbert has invented, but it's got all the words we need for the podcast. There is a sentence that largely makes no sense <laughs> in our modern language, making him sit down upon an income hardly enough to find, uh, settle down on an income that's hardly enough to live on is where that's going. Liberal-minded would be uh, generous uh, financially. And there is a clue here from Jane Austen to you by her use of a particular word. Saying that someone behaved so very handsome would be Jane Austen's indication that whoever is speaking is exposing their own vulgarity. Someone could behave handsomely but they wouldn't be behaving handsome. Charles Dickens, obviously, was very, very good at embedding misused language like this into characters, either for comedic effect or, in a case like this, to indicate that someone has been perhaps putting on airs and raising themselves above where they actually are, class-wise, societally, that kind of thing. Because the, the use of language at a time when uh, lingual specificity was on the rise, uh, certainly, I'm sure, as a way to keep people from rising above their class, just like when the middle class was finally able to afford silver coffee pots, the rich invented chocolate pots so that there would be one more silver thing that the middle class couldn't afford. And thus, we wind up with keeping up with the Joneses like we do now. 
Something for you Austin fans who've read a lot of Jane Austen. When you hear the sum of money that Mr. Moreland is able to give to James for his proposed marriage to Isabella, your eyebrows may go up and you will say, well, that's definitely not Mr. Darcy. And you're correct. Not only is it not Mr. Darcy, which I mean, seriously, with that many kids, <laughs> but not, not just with that many kids, but on purpose, your eyebrows should go up because Jane Austen wants you to recognize that it's a, it's a living. It's the smallest living we've heard of in any of her books. Later, an even smaller sum is mentioned. And one of the annotations says, actually, that smaller sum is so small as to not even be worthy of talking about. It's ridiculously small. And in fact, if that was all that was available, the young couple, and this may be where Jane got that sum from, would be advised not to marry because that simply was not enough to keep them out of poverty. So that's just, if your ears prick up, you are reading that situation correctly. Jane is saying that to you on purpose. There is a reminder when we get to chapter two of volume two or chapter 17 for us. Originally, the Allens were only going to stay in Bath for six weeks. They are there because Mr. Allen is taking the waters medically. There was a belief that the, the water's curative properties wouldn't hit all at once, but would build up over time, which makes sense because if one of the things that you were suffering from, and this is true even today, if one of the things that you're suffering from is a mineral deficiency, like you don't have enough magnesium in your system, and the way we eat and the way our food is grown, it's very possible that we wouldn't have enough magnesium in our system. Going and drinking mineral waters would they would need to build up in your system over time if they were going to do you any good at all. So it's six, six weeks is about right. That's not a indulgent amount of time. Not only that, but honestly, with the amount of trouble and work it would take to go anywhere to, to visit, to, you know, hire rooms and to move in and find help and all of that, for goodness sake, it would be not something that you would want to just flit away for a weekend. You wouldn't overturn your daily life and your your household just to, to go away and have, have a fun uh, four days somewhere. We did fortnight, 14 nights, two weeks. We also have senite, which would be, if somebody said Saturday senite, that would be one week from Saturday, seven nights, senite. A marquis, or in our case, a marquess, is the second highest rank in the peerage. So peerage, you have duke at the top. So Bridgerton. You have a duke at the top, and then you have a marquess. Anybody who's hanging out with dukes and marquesses is doing just fine for themselves as far as having access to important people in high places and probably a lot of money. And with that tempting tidbit, here we go listening to chapters 16 and 17, or volume 2, chapters 1 and 2, of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 16. Catherine's expectations of pleasure from her visit in Milson Street were so very high that disappointment was inevitable, and accordingly, though she was most politely received by General Tilney and kindly welcomed by his daughter, though Henry was at home and no one else at the party, she found on her return, without spending many hours in the examination of her feelings, that she had gone to her appointment preparing for happiness, which it had not afforded. Instead of finding herself improved in acquaintance with Miss Tilney, from the intercourse of the day, she seemed hardly so intimate with her as before. Instead of seeing Henry Tilney to greater advantage than ever in the ease of a family party, he had never said so little or been so little agreeable. And in spite of their father's great civilities to her, in spite of his thanks, invitations and compliments, it had been a release to get away from him. It puzzled her to account for all this, and it could not be General Tilney's fault, that he was perfectly agreeable and good-natured and altogether a very charming man did not admit of a doubt, for he was tall and handsome and Henry's father. 
he could not be accountable for his children's want of spirits or for her want of enjoyment in his company. The former, she hoped at last, might have been accidental, and the latter she could only attribute to her own stupidity. Isabella, on hearing the particulars of the visit, gave a different explanation. It was all pride, pride, insufferable haughtiness and pride. She had long suspected the family to be very high, and this made it certain. Such insolence of behaviour as Miss Tilney's she had never heard of in her life. Not to do the honours of her house with common good breeding, to behave to her guest with superciliousness, hardly even to speak to her. But it was not so bad as that, Isabella. There was no superciliousness. She was very civil. Oh, don't defend her. And then the brother, he who had appeared so attached to you. Good heavens! Well, some people's feelings are incomprehensible. And so he hardly looked once at you the whole day. I do not say so, but he did not seem in good spirits. How contemptible! Of all the things in the world, inconstancy is my aversion. Let me entreat you, never think of him again, my dear Catherine. Indeed, he is unworthy of you. Unworthy? I do not suppose he ever thinks of me. That's exactly what I say. He never thinks of you. Such fickleness. Oh, how different to your brother and to mine. I really believe John has the most constant heart. But as for General Tilney, I assure you it would be impossible for anyone to behave to me with greater civility and attention. It seemed to be his only care to entertain and make me happy. Oh, I know no harm of him. I do not suspect him of pride. I believe he is a very gentlemanlike man. John thinks very well of him, and John's judgment. Well, I shall see how they behave to me this evening. We shall meet them at the rooms. And must I go? Do you not intend it? I thought it was all settled. Nay, since you make such a point of it, I can refuse you nothing. But do not insist upon my being very agreeable, for my heart, you know, will be some forty miles off. And as for dancing, do not mention it, I beg. That is quite out of the question. Charles Hodges would plague me to death, I dare say, but I shall cut him very short. Ten to one he guesses the reason, and that's exactly what I want to avoid, so I shall insist on his keeping his conjectures to himself. Isabella's opinion of the Tilneys did not influence her friend. She was sure there had been no insolence in the manners either of brother or sister, and she did not credit there being any pride in their hearts. The evening rewarded her confidence. She was met by one with the same kindness, and by the other with the same attention as heretofore. Miss Tilney took pains to be near her, and Henry asked her to dance. Having heard the day before, in Milsom Street, that their elder brother, Captain Tilney, was expected almost every hour, she was at no loss for the name of a very fashionable-looking, handsome young man, whom she had never seen before, and who now evidently belonged to their party. She looked at him with great admiration, and even supposed it possible that some people might think him as handsomer than his brother, though in her eyes his air was more resuming and his countenance less prepossessing. His taste and manners were beyond a doubt decidedly inferior, for within her hearing he not only protested against every thought of dancing himself, but even laughed openly at Henry for finding it possible. From the latter circumstance it may be presumed that, whatever might be our heroine's opinion of him, his admiration of her was not of a very dangerous kind, not likely to produce animosities between the brothers, nor persecutions to the lady. He cannot be the instigator of the three villains in horsemen's greatcoats, by whom she will hereafter be forced into a travelling chaise and four, which will drive off with incredible speed. Catherine, meanwhile, undisturbed by presentments of such an evil, or of any evil at all, except that of having but a short set to dance down, enjoyed her usual happiness with Henry Tilney, listening with sparkling eyes to everything he said, and in finding him irresistible, becoming so herself. At the end of the first dance, Captain Tilney came towards them again, and, much to Catherine's dissatisfaction, pulled his brother away. They retired, whispering together, and though her delicate sensibility did not take immediate alarm and lay it down as fact that Captain Tilney must have heard some malevolent misrepresentation of her, which he now hastened to communicate to his brother in the hope of separating them forever, she could not have her partner conveyed from her sight without very uneasy sensations. Her suspense was of full five minutes' duration, and she was beginning to think it a very long quarter of an hour, when they both returned, and an explanation was given, by Henry's requesting to know if she thought her friend Miss Thorpe would have any objection to dancing, as his brother would be most happy to be introduced to her. 
Catherine, without hesitation, replied that she was very sure Miss Thorpe did not mean to dance at all. The cruel reply was passed on to the other, and he immediately walked away. "'Your brother will not mind it, I know,' she said, "'because I heard him say before that he hated dancing, "'but it was a very good-natured of him to think of it. "'I suppose he saw Isabella sitting down "'and fancied she might wish for a partner. "'But he's quite mistaken, "'for she would not dance upon any account in the world.' "'Henry smiled and said, "'How very little trouble it can give you "'to understand the motive of other people's actions.' "'Why, how do you mean?' "'With you it is not. How is such a one likely to be influenced? What is the inducement most likely to act upon such a person's feelings, age, situation, and probable habits of life considered? But how should I be influenced? What would my inducement in acting so-and-so? I do not understand you. Then we are on very unequal terms, for I understand you perfectly well. Me? Yes, I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible.' Bravo! An excellent satire on modern language. But pray tell me, what do you mean? Shall I indeed? Do you really desire it? But you're not aware of the consequences. It will involve you in a very cruel embarrassment, and certainly bring on a disagreement between us. No, no, it shall not do either, for I'm not afraid. Well then, I only meant that your attributing my brother's wish of dancing with Miss Thorpe to good nature alone... Convince me of your being superior in good nature yourself to all the rest of the world. Catherine blushed and disclaimed, and the gentleman's predictions were verified. There was a something, however, in his words which repaid her for the pain of confusion, and that something occupied her mind so much that she drew back for some time, forgetting to speak or to listen, and almost forgetting where she was till, roused by the voice of Isabella, she looked up and saw her with Captain Tilney, preparing to give them hands across. Isabella shrugged her shoulders and smiled, the only explanation of this extraordinary change which could at that time be given. But as it was not quite enough for Catherine's comprehension, she spoke her astonishment in very plain terms to her partner. I cannot think how it could happen. Isabella was so determined not to dance. And did Isabella never change her mind before? Oh, but because... And your brother... After what you told him from me, how could he think of going to ask her? I cannot take surprise to myself. On that head, you bid me be surprised on your friend's account, and therefore I am. But as for my brother, his conduct in the business, I must own, has been no more than I believed him perfectly equal to. The fairness of your friend was an open attraction. Her firmness, you know, could only be understood by yourself. You are laughing, but I assure you, Isabella is very firm in general. It is as much as should be said of any one. To be always firm must be to be often obstinate, when properly to relax is the trial of judgment, and without reference to my brother I really think Miss Thorpe has by no means chosen ill in fixing on the present hour. The friends were not able to get together for any confidential discourse till all the dancing was over, but then as they walked about the room arm in arm, Isabella thus explained herself. "'I do not wonder at your surprise, and I'm really fatigued to death. "'It's such a rattle, amusing enough if my mind had been disengaged, "'but I would have given the world to sit still. "'Then why did you not? "'Oh, my dear, it would have looked so particular, "'and you know how I abhor doing that. "'I refused him as long as I possibly could, but he would take no denial. "'You have no idea how he pressed me. "'I begged him to excuse me and get some other partner. "'But no, not he. "'After aspiring to my hands, "'there was no one else in the room he could bear to think of. "'And it was not that he wanted Millie to dance. "'He wanted to be with me. "'Oh, such nonsense. "'I told him he had taken a very unlikely way to prevail upon me. "'For of all things in the world, "'I hated fine speeches and compliments, and so and so, "'and then I found there would be no peace if I did not stand up.' "'Besides, I thought Mrs. Hughes, who introduced him, might take it in if I did not. "'And your dear brother, I'm sure he would have been miserable if I'd sat down the whole evening. "'I'm so glad it's over. My spirits are quite jaded with listening to his nonsense. "'And then, being such a smart young fellow, I saw every eye was upon us. "'He is very handsome indeed.' "'Handsome? Yes, I suppose he may. I dare say people would admire him in general. "'But he is not at all in my style of beauty.' I hate a florid complexion and dark eyes in a man. However, he's very well. Amazingly conceited, I'm sure. I took him down several times, you know, in my way. When the young ladies next met, they had a far more interesting subject to discuss. James Morland's second letter was then received, and the kind intentions of his father fully explained. 
a living of which Mr. Morland was himself patron and incumbent, of about four hundred pounds yearly value, was to be resigned to his son as soon as he should be old enough to take it. No trifling deduction from the family income, no niggardly assignment to one of ten children, an estate of at least equal value, moreover, was assured as his future inheritance. James expressed himself on the occasion with becoming gratitude, and the necessity of waiting between two and three years before they could marry being, however unwelcome, no more than he had expected, was borne by him without discontent. Catherine, whose expectations had been as unfixed as her ideas of her father's income, and whose judgment was now entirely led by her brother, felt equally well satisfied, and heartily congratulated Isabella on having everything so pleasantly settled. "'It is very charming indeed,' said Isabella with a grave face. "'Mr. Morland has behaved vastly handsomely indeed,' said the gentle Mrs. Thorpe, looking anxiously at her daughter. "'I only wish I could do as much. One could not expect more from him, you know. If he finds he can do more, by and by, I dare say he will, for I'm sure he must be an excellent good-hearted man. Four hundred is but a small income to begin on, indeed. But your wishes, my dear Isabella, are so moderate. You do not consider how little you ever want, my dear.' It is not on my own account I wish for more, but I cannot bear to be the means of injuring my dear Morland, making him sit down upon an income hardly enough to find one in the common necessities of life. For myself it is nothing, I never think of myself. I know you never do, my dear, and you will always find your reward in the affection it makes everybody feel for you. There never was a young woman so beloved as you are by everybody that knows you, and I dare say when Mr. Morland sees you, my dear child— but do not let us distress our dear Catherine by talking of such things. Mr. Morland has behaved so very handsomely, you know. I always heard he was the most excellent man. And you know, my dear, we are not to suppose, but what if you had a suitable fortune, he would have come down with something more, for I am sure he must be the most liberal-minded man. Nobody can think better of Mr. Morland than I do, I am sure. But everybody has their failing, you know, and everybody has a right to do what they like with their own money. Catherine was hurt by these insinuations. "'I'm very sure,' she said, "'that my father has promised to do as much as he can afford.' Isabella recollected herself. "'As to that, my sweet Catherine, there cannot be a doubt, "'and you know me well enough to be sure "'that a much smaller income would satisfy me. "'It is not the want of more money "'that makes me just at present a little out of spirits. "'I hate money, and if our union could take place now "'upon only fifty pounds a year, "'I should not have a wish unsatisfied.' "'Ah, oh, my dear Catherine, you found me out. "'There's the sting, the long, long, endless two years and a half "'that are to pass before your brother can hold the living.' "'Yes, yes, darling Isabella,' said Mrs. Thorpe. "'We perfectly see into your heart. "'You have no disguise. "'We perfectly understood the present vexation, "'and everybody must love you the better "'for such a noble, honest affection.' "'Catherine's uncomfortable feelings began to lessen.' She endeavoured to believe that the delay of the marriage was the only source of Isabella's regret, and when she saw her at their next interview as cheerful and amiable as ever, endeavoured to forget that she had for a minute thought otherwise. James soon followed his letter, and was received with the most gratifying kindness. Chapter 17 The Allens had now entered on the sixth week of their stay in Bath, and whether it should be the last was for some time a question, to which Catherine listened with a beating heart. To have her acquaintance with the Tilneys end so soon was an evil which nothing could counterbalance. Her whole happiness seemed at stake while the affair was in suspense, and everything secured when it was determined that the lodgings should be taken for another fortnight. What this additional fortnight was to produce to her, beyond the pleasure of sometimes seeing Henry Tilney, made but a small part of Catherine's speculation. Once or twice, indeed, since James's engagement had taught her what could be done, she had got so far as to indulge in a secret, perhaps. But in general, the felicity of being with him for the present bounded her views. The present was now comprised in another three weeks, and her happiness being certain for that period, the rest of her life was at such a distance as to excite but little interest. In the course of the morning, which saw this business arranged, she visited Miss Tilney, and poured forth her joyful feelings. It was doomed to be a day of trial. No sooner had she expressed her delight in Mr. Allen's lengthened stay, than Miss Tilney told her of her father's having just determined upon quitting Bath by the end of another week. Here was a blow. 
The past suspense of the morning had been ease and quiet to the present disappointment. Catherine's countenance fell, and in a voice of most sincere concern she echoed Miss Tilney's concluding words. By the end of another week. Yes, my father can seldom be prevailed upon to give the waters what I think a fair trial. He has been disappointed by some friend's arrival who he expected to meet here, and as he is now pretty well, he is in a hurry to get home. I am very sorry for it said Catherine dejectedly. If I'd known this before... Perhaps, said Miss Tilney in an embarrassed manner, you would be so good. It would make me very happy if... The entrance of her father put a stop to the civility which Catherine was beginning to hope might introduce the desire of their corresponding. After addressing her with his usual politeness, he turned to his daughter and said, Well, Eleanor, may I congratulate you on being successful in your application to your fair friend? I was just beginning to make the request, sir, as you came in. Well, proceed by all means. I know how much your heart is in it. My daughter, Miss Morland, he continued, without leaving his daughter time to speak, had been forming a very bold wish. We leave Bath, as she had perhaps told you, on Saturday sennight. A letter from my steward tells me that my presence is wanted at home, and being disappointed in my hope of seeing the Marquis of Longtown and General Courtney here, some of my very old friends, there's nothing to detain me longer in Bath. And could we carry our selfish point with you? We should leave it without a single regret. Can you, in short, be prevailed upon to quit this scene of public triumph and oblige your friend, Eleanor, with your company in Gloucestershire? I'm almost ashamed to make the request, though its presumption would certainly appear greater to every creature in Bath than yourself, a modesty such as yours. But not for the world would I pain it by open praise. If you can be induced to honour us with a visit, you will make us happy beyond expression. "'Tis true we can offer you nothing like the gaieties of this lively place. "'We can tempt you neither by amusement nor splendour, "'for our mode of living, as you see, is plain and unpretending. "'Yet no endeavours shall be wanting on our side "'to make Northanger Abbey not wholly disagreeable.' "'Northanger Abbey!' "'These were thrilling words, "'and wound up Catherine's feelings to the highest points of ecstasy. "'Her grateful and gratified heart could hardly restrain its expressions "'within the language of tolerable calmness. "'To receive so flattering an invitation, "'to have her company so warmly solicited, "'everything honourable and soothing, "'every present enjoyment and every future hope was contained in it, "'and her acceptance, with only the saving clause of papa and mamma's approbation, "'was eagerly given. "'I will write home directly,' said she, and if they do not object, as I dare say they will not. General Tilney was not less sanguine, having already waited on her excellent friends in Pulteney Street, and obtained their sanction of his wishes. Since they can consent to part with you, said he, we may expect philosophy from all the world. Miss Tilney was earnest, though gentle in her secondary civilities, and the affair became in a few minutes as nearly settled as this necessary reference to Fullerton would allow. The circumstances of the morning had led Catherine's feelings through the varieties of suspense, security and disappointment, but they were now safely lodged in perfect bliss, and with spirits elated to rapture, with Henry at her heart and Northanger Abbey on her lips, she hurried home to write her letter. Mr and Mrs Morland, relying on the discretion of their friends to whom they had already entrusted their daughter, felt no doubt of the propriety of an acquaintance which had been formed under their eye, and sent, therefore, by return of post, their ready consent to her visit in Gloucestershire. This indulgence, though not more than Catherine had hoped for, completed her conviction of being favoured beyond every other human creature in friends, fortune, circumstance and chance. Everything seemed to cooperate for her advantage. By the kindness of her first friends, the Allens, she had been introduced into scenes where pleasures of every kind had met her. Her feelings, her preferences had each known the happiness of a return. Wherever she felt attachment, she had been able to create it. The affection of Isabella was to be secured to her in a sister. The Tilneys, they by whom above all she desired to be favourably thought of, outstripped even her wishes in the flattering measures by which their intimacy was to be continued. She was to be their chosen visitor. She was to be for weeks under the same roof with the person whose society she most prized, and in addition to all the rest, this roof was to be the roof of an abbey. Her passion for ancient edifices was next in degree to her passion for Henry Tilney, 
and castles and abbeys made usually the charm of those reveries which his images did not fill. To see and explore either the ramparts and keeps of the one or the cloisters of the other had been for many weeks a darling wish, though to be more than the visitor of an hour had seemed too nearly impossible for desire, and yet this was to happen, with all the chances against her, of house, hall, place, park, court and cottage, Northanger turned up an abbey. She was to be its inhabitant. Its long, damp passages, its narrow cells and ruined chapel were to be within her daily reach, and she could not entirely subdue the hope of some traditional legends, some awful memories of an injured, ill-fated nun. It was wonderful that her friend should seem so little elated by the possession of such a home, that the consciousness of it should be so meekly born. The power of early habit could only account for it. A distinction to which they had been born gave no pride. Their superiority of abode was no more to them than their superiority of person. Many were the inquiries she was eager to make of Miss Tilney, but so active were her thoughts that, when these inquiries were answered, she was hardly more assured than before of Northanger Abbey having been a richly endowed convent at the time of the Reformation, of its having fallen into the hands of an ancestor of the Tilneys on its dissolution, and of a large portion of the ancient building still making a part of the present dwelling, although the rest was decayed, or of its standing low in a valley, sheltered from the north and east by rising woods of oak. Ta-da! Finally, the name of the book makes sense. Yes, Northanger Abbey is where Henry Tilney lives. I mean, can you even? Here, Catherine meets this guy, and he's cute, and he's funny, and he's nice, and he's he's got a really good wicked sense of humor. And it, could it get better? Why, yes. Yes, it could. Because dude lives in an abbey. Okay, so we are all familiar with Downton Abbey. Now, whether Downton Abbey, the, the building that they selected, uh, Highclere Castle, was actually a decent stand-in for something called Downton Abbey is an argument for another day. Normally, when you have a place, a modern place that is called something Abbey, it is a, a location, land, that at one time held an abbey before Henry the Eighth came along, and Thomas Cromwell caused the dissolution of the monasteries and and all of that Reformation craziness started. When the abbeys were quote unquote reformed, that often meant doing things like taking all of the useful, costly things out of or off of the building, including things like leaded roofs. This is why Tintern Abbey is what it is now, which is walls. Beautiful, gorgeous, incredible, extraordinary walls, but basically walls. Glastonbury Abbey, walls, lots of abbeys, walls. That said, some of the abbeys and, and monasteries at that time were given as gifts to people. Cromwell was one of them. When that happened, you had buildings that were buildings that had been constructed for communal living and uh, places of, of study or scriptorums and, and actual written work, you had to convert those places into warm and comfortable living quarters or what would have passed for warm and comfortable at the time. Often those buildings, the original buildings, were also quite old. This is where you get this image that Anne Radcliffe and, and that group milked for everything they could in uh, having these worn, tired, run-down, mysterious, dark, cold stone edifices that they could pump for gothic horror reasons, but that human people who wanted to live in them would probably have to do some work on. Tenant of Wildfell Hall, there was an entire wing of Wildfell Hall that was unoccupied because it was not in good repair. They had only repaired the one wing that our family was living in. That would have made perfect sense at the time and perfect sense even earlier. A lot of places, and this is why Highclere Castle may very well have been actually 
a perfect stand-in for something called Downton Abbey. A lot of times the buildings were just raised. The land was kept. The buildings were, for the most part, raised and completely rebuilt. Sometimes it's kind of a mishmash of of rebuilding and uh, keeping parts intact. One of the other things that made it more useful, interesting, good for people to rebuild, whether they tore down the original building or not, was that back in the day when a lot of these Gothic abbeys were built, uh, they were built down in valleys or divots in the land because, number one, you wanted to be protected from wind and weather. And number two, you may want to have tried to hide yourself from easy observation from a distance. Later in the time period that we're in now and and even before that, you wanted a view and protection against marauding forces, uh, whether it's Danes or Romans, wouldn't have been quite as important. And so putting your home on a rise where you could see your lands and appreciate the vastness thereof, that would have been more desirable, which is where Downton Abbey comes in, because that was kind of on a rise and had quite a lovely view. So, yes, we finally get our North Anger up. Not that we're there yet, but we know we're going, and that's awesome, and Catherine's so excited. But there are a couple other things we need to go back and take a, a closer look at. So we've, we've met more Tilneys, and we saw Isabella dancing with elder brother Tilney. So Henry's not the eldest, which is therefore why he is a clergyman. And we figured out what he was, 24, 25-ish. So he's probably only been in his position for a couple of years at the most. So we've, we've seen Isabella's interesting behavior. Did it surprise you? It didn't surprise me at all. But we also saw Catherine do her wonderful, I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible. This is a step beyond, I'm sorry, I don't understand, and into, I'm sorry, I don't have the power to obfuscate my words and, and make myself sound impressive while saying actually nothing. Instead, I am just plain spoken and honest. And how marvelous is that? Now, on the, on the flip side of the characterization coin, uh, we've gotten to see General Tilney a little bit more. and. Uh, Eleanor, Miss Tilney, as the mistress of the household, should be the one to uh, offer an invitation to Catherine in this specific instance. I don't know if you noticed, General Tilney came in, interrupted her by asking if she had already extended the invitation. And then when she says, well, I just started, but you interrupted me, you'll doof. He he then prevents her from doing what he had wanted her to do in the first place and takes it over himself and makes the invitation, which, I mean, it's his, he's the father. It's certainly his prerogative. It is marginally improper for him to have done it, but it is absolutely indicative of Jane Austen's characterization of him. So just as we, we got hints at the beginning of what kind of a person Isabella was going to turn out to be, we are certainly getting hints here about General Tilney as well. It is also a little concerning, odd, I'm not sure what. It's something to take note of, that he, he makes this comment about Catherine's public triumph. Now, he would, he would be referring to the socializing work that she's been doing while in Bath at basically making herself available to see and be seen and for having uh, evidently turned out to be so charming and sought after, which is kind of interesting because really we've seen James paw after her and we've seen Henry. Henry doesn't seem prone to hyperbolic announcements and certainly not around his father. We saw them at the theater and he was quiet and rather subdued around his father. I don't know where General Tilney is getting this public triumph from, but it's possible that either he's heard something from somewhere or he is himself 
rather prone to hyperbole and wanting to kind of blow smoke up Catherine's shorts, <laughs> as it were, and uh, make her, her feel that she is more important than she perhaps actually is. We don't know yet, but something's interesting there to keep an eye out for. And that, my friends, is it. I am going to go paint a little bit before work. You have a great day. Have a great weekend. Be well. Be safe. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Get a vaccine. And uh, I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Be well. Bye. Episode 555. John James Juju. Well, hello. How are you? I am vertical. I am very proud of that fact right now. Thank you very much. And I have a bunch of voicemails and emails for you and all sorts of goodness plus two chapters. So, you know, it's a bargain is what we're saying. I am also going to, in advance, apologize for my nose. We are being hit by some evil pollination activity here this week. It's been bad this week, this whole last week, because last Thursday night, I was not able to even turn on my camera. My face was so swollen and puffy and and I'm just vain enough to care. <laughs> no, but really, it, nobody needed to watch my eyes ooze on camera. Truly, it was not a pretty sight. That said, however, last night the wind kicked up, enough to wake me up in the middle of the night. And I'm in a basement right now, and it doesn't matter. I am still a snarfly mess, so I apologize if you can <laughs> hear it in my, my nose, my voice. I'm going to try and cut out the, all the snurfles. That being said, hey, it's springtime. And it got up to 80 the other day. And I, I actually went outside. It was quite lovely. And then I came back inside because it was also very pollen-y. So, <laughs> so much for that. So let's talk to some people, or at least hear from some people, who are not having horrendous allergies in their heads. First, we get to hear from... Tara Worcester, she brings us some information on dancing. And then a clip from Anne, which the, the audio was coming in kind of glitchy, but I will follow up with a comment to try and clarify. Here we go. Hello, Heather. Tara Worcester, again. You were talking at the beginning of chapter 16 and 17 about um, dancing sets, long sets, short sets. Um, four corners, four square, hands in. If you want a, a quick representation of all of this, um, The Village by M. Night Shyamalan actually has a fairly good show of these sorts of dancing. Um, it's the wedding scene at about the halfway point. Yes, the wedding is interrupted by child screaming and chaos happening because of those we do not speak of. And... It kind of like puts the on the happy event, but you get to see a good representation of that sort of dancing, um, coming together and going down the line, um, couple coming into the center and turning, and then a lot of the line of women, line of men dancing as well. Um, another representation of those sort of dancing sets and everything is actually in Downton Abbey. Whenever they go to Highlands and they have the party where they all dance real, you see, and again, it's it's real and it's uh, Scottish dancing. Oh, I'm going to get yelled at. I can't remember. It's in the Highlands. Oh, fudge. It's, it's Scotland because a Scottish man does not wear underwear under his kilt. There we go. Ha-ha. <laughs> A proper sculptman done it around or under his uh, They're in Scotland, and again, it's it's Scotland dance, Scottish dancing, but you still see the sets where the couple come together and they walk, they 
promenade, promenade down the lane of other dancers. Uh, and you get to see a set as well where one female will jump into the center of the small circle and do a bit of dancing herself, too. Uh, again, that's Downton Abbey. It's the episode where they go to the Highlands. It's after they meet Cousin Rose. So the village, but in my Shyamalan, the wedding scene, and then Downton Abbey. I hope you're having a great day, Heather. Back to the book I go. Bye. Hi, Heather. Found, discovered you and started from the beginning binging until I caught up. Something you said about foreplay made me sort of cast back to my uh, childhood, and I never really thought about that until you were describing what sin night meant. All right, so Anne Blanton called in, and Two Step on Ravelry. Anne Blanton called in and was talking about Senite and Fortnite and how when she was growing up, it was Friday next, Saturday next. That would be a week from the following, the upcoming next day of the week that you are naming. So today is Friday. If I said Saturday next, I wouldn't mean tomorrow. I would mean a week from tomorrow, the next Saturday, blah, blah, blah. And she mentioned, I think you could probably catch it towards the end, wondering about how these phrases travel. And I am here to tell you, Ms. Ann Blanton, that you are probably exactly correct. And I can tell you how to find out for realses because you mentioned Appalachia. For those who don't live in the United States, there is a gorgeous mountain range. And I'm using the word mountain because. I have lived on the East Coast long enough to feel comfortable saying that. If you have ever looked at a topographical map of the United States, or a relief map, one that's actually built out in three dimensions, you will have seen that on the western coast, you have the, the Rockies that cross north and south through Colorado, notably, and all the way up and down north and south through the, the states and up into Canada. And then further west, you get the Sierra Nevada range which is largely in California, but it also goes up north and south as well. These two mountain ranges are big, tall, craggy, young mountain ranges. Denver is colloquially known as the Mile High City because of the elevation. It is way up there. The Rockies are a very tall mountain range. And I know I have said it before that my husband, who I love, has mentioned that perhaps there is something wrong with people. <laughs> when viewing the Rockies in their covered wagons, like both sides of my family did, look at the Rockies and say, yeah, let's keep going. That that's, that's probably the sign of some <laughs> character flaw. It might be. It, it likely is. But it doesn't change the fact that the mountains are gorgeous and that I am now pretty, pretty firmly in, in the belief that from Western Colorado, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, people whose families have been there for a long time are very busy people. And that perhaps this also has something to do with the, the fact that Utah is the, the beehive state, that all of the, the families, Mormon families who, with hand wagons, with wheelbarrows, walked across the vastness of this country, often from the Mississippi River all the way to Utah. Perhaps there was a little bit restless ADDism going on there, too. <laughs> that and stubborn, right? It's amazing. It is just amazing. Every time I think of that, totally, I just, uh, blown away. So anyway, that's the West Coast. On the eastern side of the country, we have the Appalachian Mountain Range. And this also stretches north and south. However, it's a much older mountain range. And as a consequence, it's not as tall. It is smoother. It's not as craggy. Although, of course, there are parts of it where you still find craggy areas and, and some beautiful, you know, waterfall-y kind of areas and rivulets and streams and little hidden places and ravines. I'm not saying those don't exist. I'm saying that if you look at the, the mountain range as a big sum total of mountain range, it is a softer, more worn down range. And if you look at it topographically or from a satellite like Google Earth, 
you will also be able to see the residue, the impact of this part of the country being raked over by glaciers. You can see both the advance and withdrawal, especially the withdrawal tracks of, of glaciers, because you can see the sediment that the glaciers left behind. It's actually quite, quite visible, which I think is just awesome. And I bring all of this up because the Appalachians are gorgeous. If you've been watching the Outlander series that is supposed to be taking place in the States, you have seen some amazing work done by the advanced team that does location scouting. Because my understanding is that they are still filming that whole sucker in Scotland. And that's impressive because I didn't think they'd be able to pull that off. There are definitely some shots that they have CG'd, and those are the long vista shots, because long vistas in Scotland are quite clearly Scotland. However, being up close and personal in the forest, they have managed to do a pretty darn good job of fooling non-botanists and geographers into thinking that they're, they're in, um, where are they supposed to be? Carolinas? Virginia? Carolinas, Virginia, somewhere around there. Either way, they are inland far enough that they would be starting to get towards the Appalachian mountain range, if not in it. Why am I bringing all this up, all of these things together? Outlander, Anne Blanton, colloquialisms, all of these things. I am bringing them up because I know a couple of years ago, I mentioned a book I was reading pre-Scotland trip. I think it was called How the Scots Invented the Modern World. And I will put a link to this in the show notes for this episode. And yes, the, the, the website has been down. The guys who've been rebuilding it for me are working on it. I think it's working now. If it's not working now, it will be working very shortly. And at that point, it shouldn't go down again. Um, we've had some problems with the, the hosting company. It's, it's not them. Back to what I was saying about Scots. How the Scots Invented the Modern World, one of the sections is on Scott's migration patterns to the New World, to the North American part of the New World. And one of the many things that is mentioned in that book is place names and colloquialisms. And things like Schitt's Creek, spelled like or unlike the TV show. All of this stuff is actually mentioned in that book. So Anne Blanton, How the Scots Invented the Modern World, listen to that book. You should be able to get it through Hoopla or Libby through the library. It is marvelous. And it specifically talks about Appalachia and the Appalachian accents and that relationship to a Scottish accent as well. The, this is one of the reasons why I think it's so much fun to listen to the book, because the guy is, who's reading it, I'm, I'm fairly certain he's Scottish, but that he's an actor and he had received pronunciation so he, he can read it like he was born in London and sounds very posh, but then he can also fall into his native Scottish marvelously well. So yes, you are right. And yes, I think a thousand times yes. And what a lot of fun to read. I have another book recommendation for you from an email we received from Jennifer. Jennifer wrote in, and this was a while ago, so Jennifer, I totally apologize for having missed this. She said, I have come to love the books and narration of Mary Robinette Cole, spelled K-O-W-A-L. If you're not yet familiar with her, change that. I mean, Lady Astronaut of Mars? An alternate history where the space race heats up in the 50s because giant meteor strike. She reads her own stuff and also other people's stuff, and her voice reminds me of yours, and she's got a puppetry background. You sold me, as you knew you would, on Lady Astronaut of Mars? <laughs> and Jennifer goes on, So I started reading her earlier work, which is essentially Jane Austen in a world of magic, including the main character actually being named Jane. In her third book, she describes a woman as wearing a, quote-unquote, simple round gown. I got curious. I looked up what a round gown is, and the results cited a scene from Northanger Abbey. And when I checked in with Craftlet, what do I see? 
the latest book is Northanger Abbey. Jennifer then said, I stopped listening to Wild Phil Hall because the main character was such a nice guy. I couldn't stand him. Jennifer, go back, go back and listen. Because depending on what chapter you stopped in, you were so close to not having to listen to him at all for like almost half the book. So go back and pick it up. You're going to love it. I can, I can tell from your email, you're going to love it. She said, that's all. Feel free to share these contents. I'm never comfortable calling in, but do love your work. I'm so glad that you emailed. So Mary Robinette Cowell, Mary, M-A-R-Y, Robinette, R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T-E, Cowell, K-O-W-A-L. So excited to go find her books. Thank you. And here is our third voicemail, also from Tara, and a fourth voicemail from Stacy. All right, here we go. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester. On this day, April 23rd, eight years ago, I put the final stitches on the border of your craft lit blanket threw it over my head and made happy noises that were very much akin to a parrot in its cage, knowing full well you are awake and in the same room. I was so happy knowing how much you would love this blanket and knowing good and gosh darn well how much I wanted to keep it for myself because it's just how amazing. I hope you're having a great day, Heather. I hope the blanket has brought you so much love and warmth. And I cannot wait to enjoy the new chapters of the book. Hi, Heather. This is Stacy from California. And um, I'm a little bit behind, but um, I just listened to episode 544 and um, about to hear chapter 50 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And I heard you speaking about the trip to Ireland. And um, I wanted to reach out because I have a wonderful series for you to read, and it takes place in Belfast, and it takes place during the time of the Troubles. And I just, I really hope that, um, you know, if you are able to read it, that you'll enjoy it as much as I have. It's um, a series of books by the author Adrian McKinty, M-C-K-I-N-T-Y, and um, they're the, the um, Sean Duffy Detective Series, and it's um, a policeman working in Belfast at the time of the Troubles, which is uh, pretty phenomenal. And um, all six I enjoyed a lot. I even named my puppy after the lead character um, after finishing the novels. And, uh, yeah, that's all I have. And I hope that you have a wonderful trip to Ireland. I've been twice, and I would love to go back. Eight years? Tara, eight years? Oh, it makes my head bend. Eight years ago, you sent me that gorgeous afghan. Yes, a thousand times yes. I love that thing. We pull it out in the wintertime because it is quite warm, and it makes me so happy. And I love that as the world starts to get darker and grayer, I can pull that out and brighten everything up again. It is so beautiful and it never ever doesn't make me smile and be warm and happy and just love doing this and especially because it's allowed me to get to meet so many of you. I can't believe it's been eight years. We were in Virginia. Oh man, time flies. Wow. And Stacy, thank you for share. I know you won't hear this right away. Thank you for sharing the detective series. I have not heard of this. Adrian McKinty, the Sean Duffy detective books, six books set in Belfast. I am going to be checking those out along with Mary Robinette Cowell. So thank you for calling in with that information as well. Holy cow. What an embarrassment of riches we have received to us today. Thank you. Right. The book, Northanger Abbey. You do not need me today. <laughs> you just don't. I'm going to tell you this much. We are 
still arranging our chess pieces on the board, which means, as is usually true, when when we aren't into an action situation, we are getting our positions in order. Usually that is indicative of chapters that focus more on characterization. And that is certainly true for this week, as I believe it was for last week as well. You will learn more about Isabella and Thorpe. <laughs> I got I got pinged on Facebook for continually messing up James and John. They are just both J names. So I'm sticking with Thorpe, J. Thorpe, and J. Moreland, Catherine's brother. So we are going to learn more about Isabella and her brother, Thorpe, and a little bit more about Catherine's brother, J. Moreland. But we're going to learn some important stuff about Catherine as well. Not as much as we do about Isabella, but but definitely uh, some interesting things that we get to see happening for our young Catherine. So easy chapters, light chapters. Here we go with chapters 18 and 19 or volume two, chapters three and four of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Mia Dicker. Here we go. Chapter 18 With a mind thus full of happiness, Catherine was hardly aware that two or three days had passed away without her seeing Isabella for more than a few minutes together. She began first to be sensible of this and to sigh for her conversation as she walked along the pump room one morning by Mrs Allen's side without anything to say or hear, and scarcely had she felt a five minutes longing for friendship before the object of it appeared and inviting her to a secret conference, led the way to a seat. "'This is my favourite place,' said she, as they sat down on a bench between the doors which commanded a tolerable view of everybody entering at either. "'It is so out of the way!' Catherine, observing that Isabella's eyes were continually bent towards one door or the other, as in eager expectation, and remembering how often she had been falsely accused of being arch, thought the present a fine opportunity for being really so and therefore gaily said, "'Do not be uneasy, Isabella. James will be here soon.' Pshaw, my dear creature,' she replied, "'do not think me such a simpleton as to be always wanting to confine him to my elbow. It would be hideous to be always together, and we should be the jest of the place. And so you're going to Northanger. I'm amazingly glad of it. It is one of the finest old places in England, I understand. I shall depend upon a most particular description of it.' You shall certainly have the best in my power to give. But who are you looking for? Are your sisters coming? I'm not looking for anybody. One's eye must be somewhere, and you know what a foolish trick I have of fixing mine when my thoughts are a hundred miles off. I'm amazingly absent. I believe I'm the most absent creature in the world. Tilney says it's always the case with minds of a certain stamp. But I thought, Isabella, you had something in particular to tell me. Oh, yes, sir, and so I have. But here is proof of what I was saying. My poor head, I quite forgot it. Well, the thing is, I've just had a letter from John. You can guess the contents. No, indeed, I cannot. My sweet love, do not be so abominably affected. What can he write about but yourself? You know he is over head and ears in love with you. With me, dear Isabella. Nay, my sweet Catherine, this has been quite absurd. Modesty and all that is very well in its way, but really a little common honesty is sometimes quite as becoming. I've no idea of being so overstrained. It's fishing for compliments. His attentions were such as a child might have noticed, and it was but half an hour before he left Bath that you gave him the most positive encouragement. He says so in this letter. He says that he has good and made you an offer, and that you received his advances in the kindest way, and now he wants me to urge his suit and say all manner of pretty things to you, so it is in vain to affect ignorance. Catherine, with all the earnestness of truth, expressed her astonishment at such a charge, protesting her innocence of every thought of Mr Thorpe's being in love with her, and the consequent impossibility of her having ever intended to encourage him. As to any attentions on his side, I do declare upon my honour I was never sensible of them for a moment, except just his asking me to dance the first day of his coming, and as to him making me an offer or anything like that, there must be some unaccountable mistake. I could not have misunderstood a thing of that kind, you know, and as I ever wished to be believed, I solemnly protest that no syllable of such a nature ever passed between us. The last half hour before he went away? 
It must be all and completely a mistake, for I did not see him once that whole morning. But that you certainly did, for you spent the whole morning in Edgar's buildings. It was the day your father's consent came, and I'm pretty sure that you and John were alone in the parlour some time before you left the house. Are you? Well, if you say it was so, I dare say, but for the life of me I cannot recollect it. I do remember now being with you and seeing him as well as the rest, but, but that we were alone for five minutes. However, it's not worth arguing about, for whatever may pass on his side, you must be convinced at my having no recollection of it, that I never thought, nor expected, nor wished for anything of the kind from him. I am excessively concerned that he should have any regard for me. But indeed, it's been quite unintentional on my side. I never had the smallest idea of it. Please undeceive him as soon as you can, and tell him I beg his pardon. That is, I do not know what I ought to say, but make him understand what I mean in the properest way. I would not speak disrespectfully of a brother of yours, Isabella, I am sure, but you know very well that if I could think of one man more than another, he is not the person. Isabella was silent. My dear friend, you must not be angry with me. I cannot suppose your brother cares so very much about me. As you know, we shall still be sisters. Yes, yes, with a blush. There are more ways than one of our being sisters, but where am I wandering to? Well, my dear Catherine, the case seems to be that you are determined against poor John. Is it not so? I certainly cannot return his affection, and I certainly never meant to encourage it. Since that is the case, I'm sure I shall not tease you any further. John desired me to speak to you on the subject, and therefore I have. But I confess, as soon as I read his letter, I thought it very foolish, imprudent business, and not likely to promote the good of either. For what were you to live on, supposing you came together? You have both of you something, to be sure, but it's not a trifle that would support a family nowadays. After all that romancers may say, there is no doing without money. I only wonder John could think of it. He could have not received my last. You do acquit me, then, of doing anything wrong? You were convinced, then, that I never meant to deceive your brother, never suspected him of liking me till this moment? Oh, as to that, answered Isabella, laughingly, I do not pretend to determine what your thoughts and designs in times past may have been. All that is best known to yourself. A little harmless flirtation or so will occur, and one's often drawn on to give more encouragement than one wishes to stand by. But you may be assured that I am the last person in the world to judge you severely. All those things should be allowed for in youth and high spirits. What one means one day, you know, one may not mean the next. Circumstances may change. Opinions alter. But my opinion of your brother never did alter. It was always the same. You're describing what never happened. My dearest Catherine, continued the other without at all listening to her, I would not for all the world be the means of hurrying you into an engagement before you knew what you were about. I do not think any one would justify me in wishing you to sacrifice all your happiness merely to oblige my brother, because he is my brother, and who perhaps, after all, you know, might be just as happy without you, for people seldom know what they would be at, young men especially. They're so amazingly changeable and inconsistent. What I say is, why should a brother's happiness be dearer to me than a friend's? You know I carry my notions of friendship pretty high, but above all things, my dear Catherine, do not be in a hurry. Take my word for it, that if you are in too great a hurry, you will certainly live to repent it. Tilney says there's nothing people are so often deceived in as the state of their own affections, and I believe he's very right. Ah, oh, here he comes. Never mind, he will not see us, I'm sure. Catherine, looking up, perceived Captain Tilney, and Isabella, earnestly fixing her eye on him as she spoke, soon caught his notice. He approached immediately and took the seat to which her movements invited him. His first address made Catherine start, though spoken low she could distinguish. What? Always to be watched in person or by proxy? Psh, nonsense, was Isabella's answer in the same half-whisper. Why do you put such things into my head? If I could believe it, my spirit, you know, is pretty independent. I wish your heart were independent. That would be enough for me. My heart, indeed. What can you have to do with hearts? You men have none of you any hearts. If we have not hearts, we have eyes, and they give us torment enough. Do they? I'm sorry for it. I am sorry if they find anything disagreeable in me. I will look another way. I hope this pleases you. Turning her back on him, I hope your eyes are not tormented now. Never more so, for the edge of a blooming cheek is still in view. At once too much and too little. 
Catherine heard all this and, quite out of countenance, could listen no longer. Amazed that Isabella could endure it, and jealous for her brother, she rose up, and, saying she should join Mrs. Allen, proposed their walking. But for this Isabella showed no inclination. She was so amazingly tired, and it was so tedious to parade about the pump room, and if she moved from her seat, she should miss her sisters. She was expecting her sisters every moment, so that her dearest Catherine must excuse her and must sit quietly down again. But Catherine could be stubborn too, and Mrs. Allen, just then coming up to propose their returning home, she joined her and walked out of the pump room, leaving Isabella still sitting with Captain Tilney. With much uneasiness did she thus leave them. It seemed to her that Captain Tilney was falling in love with Isabella, and Isabella unconsciously encouraging him. Unconsciously it must be, for Isabella's attachment to James was as certain and well acknowledged as her engagement. To doubt her truth or good intentions was impossible, and yet, during the whole of their conversation, her manner had been odd. She wished Isabella had talked more like her usual self, and not so much about money, and had not looked so well pleased at the sight of Captain Tilney. How strange that she should not perceive his admiration! Catherine longed to give her a hint of it, to put her on her guard, and prevent all the pain to which her too lively behaviour might otherwise create for both him and her brother. The compliment of John Thorpe's affection did not make amends for this thoughtlessness in his sister. She was almost as far from believing as from wishing it to be sincere, for she had not forgotten that he could mistake, and his assertion of the offer, and of her encouragement, convinced her that his mistakes could sometimes be very egregious. In vanity, therefore, she gained but little. Her chief profit was in wonder. That he should think it worth his while to fancy himself in love with her was a matter of lively astonishment. Isabella talked of his attentions. She had never been sensible of any, but Isabella had said many things which she hoped had been spoken in haste, and would never be said again. And upon this she was glad to rest altogether for present ease and comfort. Chapter 19 a few days passed away, and Catherine, though not allowing herself to suspect her friend, could not help watching her closely. The result of her observations were not agreeable. Isabella seemed an altered creature. When she saw her, indeed surrounded only by their immediate friends, in Edgar's buildings or Pulteney Street, her change of manners was so trifling that, had it gone no farther, it might have passed unnoticed. A something of languid indifference, or of that boasted absence of mind which Catherine had never heard of before, would occasionally come across her, but had nothing worse appeared, that might only have spread new grace and inspired a warmer interest. But when Catherine saw her in public, admitting Captain Tilney's attentions as readily as they were offered, and allowing him almost an equal share with James in her notice and smiles, the alteration became too positive to be passed over. What could be meant by such unsteady conduct? What her friend could be at was beyond her comprehension. Isabella could not be aware of the pain she was inflicting, but it was a degree of willful thoughtlessness which Catherine could not but resent. James was the sufferer. She saw him, grave and uneasy, and however careless of his present comfort the woman might be who had given him her heart, to her it was always an object. For poor Captain Tilney, too, she was greatly concerned. Though his looks did not please her, his name was a passport to her goodwill, and she thought with sincere compassion of his approaching disappointment. For in spite of what she had believed herself to overhear in the pump room, his behaviour was so incompatible with the knowledge of Isabella's engagement that she could not upon reflection imagine him aware of it. He might be jealous of her brother as a rival, but if more had seem implied, the fault must have been in her misapprehension. She wished, by a gentle remonstrance, to remind Isabella of her situation and make her aware of this double unkindness. But for remonstrance, either the opportunity or comprehension was always against her. If able to suggest a hint, Isabella could never understand it. In this distress, the intended departure of the Tilney family became her chief consolation. Their journey into Gloucestershire was to take place within a few days, and Captain Tilney's removal would at least restore peace to every heart but his own. But Captain Tilney had at present no intention of removing. He was not to be of the party to Northanger. He was to continue at Bath. When Catherine knew this, her resolution was directly made. 
She spoke to Henry Tilney on the subject, regretting his brother's evident partiality for Miss Thorpe and entreating him to make known her prior engagement. My brother does know it, was Henry's answer. Does he? Then why does he stay here? He made no reply and was beginning to talk of something else, but she eagerly continued. Why did you not persuade him to go away? The longer he stays, the worse it will be for him at last. Pray advise him for his own sake and for everybody else to leave Bath directly. Absence will in time make him comfortable again, but he can have no hope here, and it is only staying to be miserable. Henry smiled and said, I am sure my brother would not wish to do that. Then will you persuade him to go away? Persuasion is not at command, but pardon me if I cannot even endeavour to persuade him. I have myself told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged. He knows what he's about and must be his own master. No, he does not know what he is about, cried Catherine. He does not know the pain he has given my brother. Not that James has ever told me so, but I'm sure he's very uncomfortable. And are you sure it's my brother's doing? Yes, I'm very sure. Is it my brother's attentions to Miss Thorpe, or Miss Thorpe's admission of them, that gives the pain? Is it not the same thing? I think Mr. Morland would acknowledge the difference. No man is offended by another man's admiration of the woman he loves. It is the woman only who can make it a torment. Catherine blushed for her friend and said, and Sibella is wrong, but I'm sure she cannot mean to torment, for she's very much detached to my brother. She's been in love with him ever since they first met, and while my father's consent was uncertain, she fretted herself almost into a fever. You know she must be attached to him. I understand. She's in love with James and flirts with Frederick. Oh, no, not flirts. A woman in love with one man cannot flirt with another. It is probable that she will neither love so well nor flirt so well as she might do either singly. The gentlemen must each give up a little. After a short pause, Catherine resumed with, Then you do not believe Isabella so very much attached to my brother? I can have no opinion on that subject. But what can your brother mean? If he knows her engagement, what can he mean by his behaviour? You are a very close questioner. Am I? I only ask what I want to be told. But do you only ask what I can be expected to tell? Yes, I think so. But you must know your brother's heart. My brother's heart, as you term it, on the present occasion I assure you I can only guess at. Well? Well? Nay, if it is to be guesswork, let us all guess for ourselves. To be guided by a second-hand conjecture is pitiful. The premises are before you. My brother is a lively and perhaps sometimes a thoughtless young man. He has had about a week's acquaintance with your friend, and he has known her engagement almost as long as he's known her. Well, said Catherine after some moments' consideration, you may be able to guess at your brother's intentions from all this, but I'm sure I cannot. But is not your father uncomfortable about it? Does not he want Captain Tilney to go away? Sure, if your father were to speak to him, he would go. My dear Miss Morland, said Henry, in this amiable solicitude for your brother's comfort, may you not be a little mistaken? Are you not carried a little too far? Would he thank you, either on his own account or Miss Thorpe's, for supposing that her affection, or at least her good behaviour, is only to be secured by her seeing nothing of Captain Tilney? Is he safe only in solitude? Or is her heart constant to him only when unsolicited by anyone else? He cannot think this, and you may be sure he would not have you think it. I will not say do not be uneasy, because I know that you are so at this moment, but be as little uneasy as you can. You have no doubt of the mutual attachment of your brother and your friend. Depend upon it, therefore, that real jealousy can never exist between them. Depend upon it that no disagreement between them can be of any duration. Their hearts are open to each other, as neither heart can be to you. They know exactly what is required and what can be borne, and you can be certain that one will never tease the other beyond what is known to be pleasant. Perceiving her still to look doubtful and grave, he added, Though Frederick does not leave Bath with us, he will probably remain but a very short time, perhaps only a few days behind us. His leave of absence will soon expire, and he must return to his regiment. And what then will be their acquaintance? The mess-room will drink Isabella Thorpe for a fortnight, and she will laugh with your brother over poor Tilney's passion for a month. 
Catherine would contend no longer against comfort. She had resisted its approaches during the whole length of the speech, but it now carried her captive. Henry Tilney must know best. She blamed herself for the extent of her fears and resolved never to think so seriously on the subject again. Her resolution was supported by Isabella's behaviour in their parting interview. The Thorpe spent the last evening of Catherine's stay in Pulteney Street, and nothing passed between the lovers to excite her uneasiness or to make her quit them in apprehension. James was in excellent spirits, and Isabella most engagingly placid. Her tenderness for her friend seemed rather the first feeling of her heart, but that at such a moment was allowable, and once she gave her lover a flat contradiction, and once she drew back her hand. But Catherine remembered Henry's instructions, and placed it all to judicious affection. The embraces, tears and promises of the parting fair ones may be fancied. Yeah, so, Catherine defended herself, which made me very happy, in, in standing up for the fact that she was not proposed to, and she was not. Thorpe was definitely kind of hedging around the conversation topic, but he certainly never flat out said, hey, babe, let's get hitched. That said, ew, the other thing that you probably picked up on is Isabella was talking about Tilney. Now, Tilney for her is Captain Tilney, not General, not Daddy Tilney. Captain Tilney, older brother to Henry Tilney. And that's troublesome because that's a level of familiarity between Isabella and Captain Tilney that should make us all just a wee bit uncomfortable. It's certainly starting to make Catherine uncomfortable. And her reactions are the most full of spine, I think, that we've seen from Catherine to date. Which is lovely because I certainly wanted her to respond like that. Definitely. I also appreciated the fact that it appeared in the text that Catherine speaking to Henry Tilney was without any kind of romantic fanfare. There was no, she had to maneuver herself into a dance set with Henry to be able to find a way to discuss this delicate thing with him. No, it was, she was upset. So she spoke to Henry Tilney on the subject. Boom. And that's it. And then I loved Henry's response to her. You know, he, he listens, he takes her seriously. He's not making fun of her at all. And she's shocked to find out that Captain Tilney does know that Isabella is connected to her brother. Henry Tilney says, I have myself told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged. He knows what he's about and must be his own master. And she says he doesn't know what he's about. He doesn't know the pain he's giving my brother. Not that James has ever told me so, but I'm quite sure that he's uncomfortable, which I just love. It's so sweet of her. And he said, are you very sure it's my brother's doing? Yes, very sure. Is it my brother's attentions to Miss Thorpe or Miss Thorpe's admission of them that gives the pain? Her response, is it not the same thing, is so innocent. Henry Tilney's response, I think Mr. Moreland, your brother, would acknowledge a difference, is really important. And it goes back to something that I know we've talked about before on the podcast, especially when we've had romances, that women will attack other women for going after my guy or stealing my guy, but they won't acknowledge the fact that perhaps Part of the problem is that your guy was so easily swayed by another female. It has less to do with her flirtations and a lot more to do with his inconstancy. Here it's flipped. Perhaps the problem isn't that Captain Tilney is being an audacious flirt, my goodness, but that Isabella is allowing it. And that's an important lesson, not just for Catherine, but for all young women, I would posit. Yet another book. Here we are. Yet another book that would be good for young women to read. I wish I had read this book when I was younger myself. For one thing, it's just a lot of fun. 
So I hope you are continuing to enjoy Northanger with me. I hope you are continuing to enjoy the awesome Maya Daguerre and sending some love from you to her in a way of thanks. All those links are in the show notes. And if, again, the actual craftlit.com website is still down, you can always find Craftlit at craftlit.libsyn.com. For reasons which are unclear to me at this time, Libsyn is not able to post directly to Facebook. I am working on that. I do not know what's going on, but, but we're working on all that. Thank you so much for your support, for being awesome, for writing in, for calling in. If you want to call in, please do at area code 206-350-1642. Or you can write at heather at craftlet.com. And I'll talk to you later. Be well. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Get vaccinated. Wear a mask. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Episode 556, Enter the Abbey. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am so grateful to everyone who was on the Thursday night Zoom call this week because, holy cow, did I get a treasure trove of information for everybody else? <laughs> because my life is boring, I am collecting information from everywhere and all of the smart people. And I have some good stuff for you. And I'm going to kick it off with a voicemail from Christine, who you will remember from Tin of Tans back when I still lived in Arizona. So first, we hear from Christine. Hi, Heather. This is Tin of Tans, Christine. I am very thankful for the fun uh, chapters you've been reading. Maya Daguerre is lovely. Got me through a I, um, got me through a very bad migraine headache this week. I heard that someone was recommending Mary Robinette Kowal's books, and they are lovely. I thought you would all like to know that she's also a regular host of the Writing Excuses podcast where um, she and three other regular writers plus some guests talk about the business and craft of writing. And anyone who likes to listen to ideas about how things are made, whether or not they make that thing, it can be interesting. So I like listening to books. It's fun for me to listen to how people who write them do it. It's sort of like if you like to knit or crochet, it can be fun to read about how they were designed, although, you know, that can also get old. I have to write those sometimes, and they get old to write. One more thing, Mary Robinette Kowal crochets, and the um, Regency dress that's on the cover of one of her, oh, I can't remember the name of those, that series. Anyway, she made that by hand. and she used a silk sari for the base. So sometimes she'll write in her end notes about the history of textiles. So I think a lot of people who enjoy your podcast would enjoy reading Mary Robinette Kowal's works and looking for in other spaces on the web too. And probably a lot of you would enjoy the Writing Excuses podcast. All right. So the comment on Mary Robinette Kowal's got repeated again. Christine, you are backed up by many people. I've heard from quite a few, including Jennifer at our Thursday night Zoom, which again, you are all welcome to join. The easiest way to find the link right now is on the Facebook group, and I will put it into the show notes as well. The show notes are easiest to find on the app, or at craftlit.libsyn.com until we get the website back up and running, which it will. It's just, there are things that have been going on on the interwebs in the way of trying to protect people that are interfering with the way things have been done in the past. It was much easier to do a whole podcasty thing back in, say, 2006. 
it is a lot more complicated now and weird stuff keeps happening. So I appreciate your patience. The app should be working again. I did have to restart my phone because it went through a massive update. I am not unhappy about that. The app is better now. So that's good. And last night, Amy alerted me to the fact that there were questions hanging out out there in Facebook land in particular, asking what is the, the best way to support Craftlet, which I really appreciate. I think that is lovely, especially because I have a feeling I'm going to be unemployed again shortly. The best way to support Craftlet is whatever's easiest for you. The amount of money that is taken out in fees and things like that is just about equivalent. Whether you are supporting the show through the app or whether you are supporting the show through Patreon. Either way, it winds up being about the same amount of loss. So it comes out to what's the easiest access point for you. Go with that. That is awesome sauce. And thank you. So we have on the show notes, I put the links in again for Mary Robinette Cole, in case you didn't find them before, a link to the Writing Excuses podcast, a link to, Jennifer also shared, I think it was Jennifer, A Memory Called Empire, which is a science fiction murder mystery. And then Leanne shared that if you, that is you, you yourself, want to vote for the Hugo Awards, this is something that normal mortals can do. If you go to the Hugo Awards website, their governing body, and you purchase for like 45, 50 bucks, something like that, a supporting membership, they will send you digitally all of the things that are being voted on. <laughs> and then you can read all of the things that are being voted on for that 40 or 50, 45 or 50 bucks. And then you vote. How cool is that? It's like normal people get to participate in stuff. I love it. So that's pretty nifty. Then we we wandered away from books for a little while and went into music. So I have a link out to Marion Call's song, I'll Still Be a Geek After Nobody Thinks It's Chic, which is also known as the Nerd Anthem. We have a YouTube link to that and a YouTube link to Double Click's Oh Mr. Darcy, which just made me happy. And then we have an update on things to watch. One. The Mitchells versus the Machines. Holy cow. If you haven't seen this yet, it's on Netflix. I would recommend not drinking a lot of liquid before seeing it. I did not think it was going to be that funny or make me laugh that hard. But Maya Rudolph as the mom. Maya Rudolph. I'm saying Maya because I'm so used to saying Maya Daguerre. Ha! Thanks, Maya. <laughs> Maya Rudolph is spectacular as the mother. And as soon as she kicks into gear during the climax, both of my boys turned and looked at me and said, oh my gosh, you would totally do that, wouldn't you? And of course, the answer is yes. Yes, of course I would. The other thing about the Mitchells versus the machines that you need to know is that there's a scene early on where the young brother named Aaron (laughs) does some things as a young child that everyone in our family looked at our Aaron and said, oh my God, they were watching you. You need to know that he was one of the people who said that as well to himself. It is spectacular and adorable. And anyone who's had a boy in their family who has liked dinosaurs, (laughs) you will, you will find it very, very sweet. So Mitchell's versus the Machines is the first one up on Netflix. Second on Netflix, Stowaway, starring Tony Collette and Anna Kendrick. Then over on Amazon Prime, we have a recommendation for The Wilds. And I think, Amy, you said somebody you know got cast in the second season of that or something. That was very cool. And then from Kelly, the secretly incredibly fascinating podcast, which sounds to be exactly right up my alley as well. Kelly knows me well. Thank you. All right. So that is everything I collected last night before I had to get off because I was exhausted. I had to get up early -er to record today and I didn't want to not get you the two chapters 
that we have for today. That would be chapters 20 and 21. I'm excited because we're moving. We are in motion today and heading to the Abbey. So not only do you get to see the outside of the Abbey in today's chapters, but you will get to go inside as well. But we do have some things to understand before we dive into the chapters. And some of these are a little bit different from usual because it's kind of subtextual to us information. And I say subtextual to us because anybody who'd been reading it back in the day would have understood without even blinking what was being said. We simply don't travel like this anymore in most places. And as a consequence, there's information that's just not being transmitted unless we have annotations. So here I'm going to go in order as we find these things uh, coming to us in our chapters today. So the first bit is actually physical comedy. And it's beautifully written because Jane Austen actually writes it quite quickly as well. So it's compressed language and and you kind of can't help but read it rather quickly, or your, your eyes skim over it rather quickly. We know that the general, General Tilney, likes to be, not surprisingly, a little punctual. And he's, he's nuts about being on time. And so as a consequence, everything must be loaded into the carriages on time. And that means things are a bit of a hustle and a bustle, because of course, things probably aren't packed until right before on time. So Austin has a scene where things are being, quote unquote, handed down, which is the trunks are being carried downstairs by servants, and then they're being gotten into the carriages as quickly as possible. So this creates a bit of slapstick, because instead of the general's coat being out for him to wear in the carriage he's going to be riding in with Henry, his coat is laid out on the seat in the chaise that Eleanor and Catherine and Eleanor's lady's maid are all going to be riding in. So it's like putting a, a stadium blanket down in the chaise, and they're all supposed to now sit on it. Plus, there's a thing about a chaise, there's a, a fixed seat for three in the chaise, and then there's another seat, usually, that can be taken out. In this case, the phrase is, the middle seat of the chaise was not drawn out, though there were three people to get into it. So they only need seats for three people. Well, the bench seat, the, the main seat in the back, is plenty wide enough for three young ladies to sit on. They don't need that middle seat. It should have been taken out, removed. But instead, it was left there. And so these three girls have to cram in to their seats with all of their parcels and packages. And that creates more slapstick, including Catherine almost losing her new writing desk. And if you haven't seen writing desks of the style that she's talking about, I will link out to one. It's a, a portable wooden box with a slanted top that had, the slanted top was actually a lid. And if you flip the lid open, there's space for paper, quills, ink, all of that kind of stuff. And then when you close the lid, because it's on a slant, you can use it as a writing surface. And you can put the ink bottle and the quill on top where the hinged bit is. There's usually a little platform shelf flat area that is not sloped, so the ink won't slide off of it. It would be horizontal to the ground. So that's the writing desk that Catherine almost loses in the melee of getting into the carriages in the first place. There is the mention of a two hours bait at Petit France. Petit France is a town north of Bath. It's about halfway to their destination. And a bait, it's a rest stop. It's an opportunity for them to feed the horses and pause. Now, if they were traveling by post, post chaise, where you are paying a company to take you from point to point to point, and at each point you would switch out horses, and get a new team of horses and then keep going, you would not have a two-hour pause. You would pause long enough to switch out the team of horses, perhaps get some 
sustenance to travel with at a local inn and then move along. General Tilney owns all of his horses, and he's giving them a two-hour rest halfway through the journey. This indicates, number one, that he's got some serious cash. Number two, that he cares about the horses. Or it could be, number three, he is kind of a penny pincher and just doesn't want the horses to wear out because they're an expense to replace. A little hard to tell at this point when, when it comes to General Tilney. Either way, it is an extended stop, the two-hour bait. And then there's one, one last bit about the chaise. So the carriage has room for three in back. It has an extra seat that you can insert to turn that into six. But part of the reason why the chaise is such an odd-ish kind of transport is because there's no seat for a coachman which means that you need postillions. You need guys who ride horseback on uh, the horses who are drawing this particular carriage. And if they are particularly good postillions, they would be posting as they ride. That means they would be doing that remarkably timing-intensive move on horseback where you actually stand up in the stirrups at the same rhythm that the horse is going at. So you are more comfortable <laughs> and you are doing a better job of moving with the horse and not wearing them out by fighting their motion quite as much as you, you could otherwise. <laughs> but it's really quite something to see when you have a, a team of horses and guys who are on those horses doing this particular maneuver. It also means that these guys must have the most amazing quads ever, which is not a bad thing either. Outriders would be extra riders. These would be other servants and people who are also traveling back to the main home with General Tilney. They are part of the entourage, but they would be riding not right in front of or right in back of, but kind of out and not super close to the carriages that, is, that are carrying the family. One of the annotations that I am not going to read to you because it's complicated, I'm going to sum up for you, and it is this. As we have seen with Austin all the way through this book, she has been really accurate when she talks about how long it takes to get places and how far things are away from everywhere else and all of that information. She's really gone to town with the accuracy of distance and how quickly or not animals, like horses, can travel those distances. She is doing the same here with General Tilney's carriages, and that's awesome. It gets complicated, but the upshot, what you need to know is General Tilney is actually doing an interesting thing here. He is, by having more horses pulling the carriages than are strictly necessary, he is making sure that none of the horses are pulling the full weight. Having more than one horse pull at a time means that neither horse has to work as much as they would if it was just them. That makes a certain amount of sense. However, he's even gone above and beyond that. And because he keeps a steady pace and has more than the required number of horses, he is actually able to make better time and doesn't have to stop as often. So instead of doing the penny wise but a pound foolish, he's actually gone ahead and said, okay, it may be more money to maintain these horses, the, the number of horses, but I wear them out more slowly. <laughs> they're, they're not going to, as many horses did at the time, die a young death. They are going to be well-maintained, well-fed, well-cared for. They are not going to be overworked. And as a consequence, and ooh, this is a little Elizabeth Gaskell-like with her whole North and South how to run a factory thing. As a consequence of not having them overworked, overtaxed, and miserable, they are going to work better and ultimately go faster. We will be able to maintain a better pace. We won't have to stop as much. So even though they take this big two-hour break midway through their journey, they're only taking one instead of four. So General Tilney's a smart, smart 
guy. He also actually does appear to care. It's just in weird ways that we can see how he's caring, which is a little piece of information to file away for the future. Now, there's one thing I'm going to give you a very short bit of information on right now, and then I want to fill you in on some funny stuff about it after. You're going to hear something about a Rumford that a a formerly large, wide, I'm thinking, in, in my own mind, I am thinking not so much Gothic, but I am thinking of Citizen Kane and the big, big room that has the big, big fireplace that you could roast several humans in on spits. I am thinking of a fireplace like that having been reduced in width and size to what is called a Rumford. Rumford was an American who moved to Britain after the revolution. So he was a loyalist. He moved back to Britain. He became Count Rumford. He was an interesting guy. Anyway, he did to fireplaces what Benjamin Franklin did to stoves. So if you've ever seen a Franklin stove, this was a cast iron stove that could be put into a fireplace. And of course, the radiating heat coming off of the sides and front of a cast iron stove, not to mention the cooking space that it put on top of that stove, would have done a much better job of heating a room than a mere fireplace could have done. We have talked in the past about fireplace screens and how difficult it was to find a place in a room where one could be warmed appropriately <laughs> from a fireplace. A metal, a cast iron stove would have done much more good. Rumford came along and found a way to not have to use cast iron in order to accomplish that, but in fact could do much the same thing with slabs of marble, which hadn't really been used much in Britain up until this point. And so the beginning of the 1800s, end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, a bunch of things were changing. Duh, Heather. In Britain at the time, one of those was the importing of Italian marble. So a Rumford fireplace meant that that big, gothic, expansive, human roasting sized fireplace would have been reduced to an aperture of about a foot, maybe a foot and a half wide. It also meant that the heat would have been better aimed, more concentrated, and it would have made the room far less drafty. It also would have made it far less gothic sexy is the problem. But I'll tell you more about the humorous side of the Rumford. It's such a perfect name for it, too. Thank God that was his last name. I'll tell you more on the flip side. There's some fun stuff. Casement windows. This is where the window glass usually leaded, usually in diamond-shaped panes with diagonal leading, were placed into metal cases. Those cases then had latches, metal latches, that attached on one side, they were hinged. On the other side, you had these latches. The latches you could move up or down. And by moving the handle up or down, you would be able to push the casement window out or in, depending on the way the hinges worked. But either way, the, the windows weren't sliding the way that sash windows that we are still using today do. These were the kind of windows that would swing like a door in or out. And of course, with frames like that, they would rattle when the wind blew. They would be very hard to seal. So you get very, very drafty draftiness. The importance here of having lead, this flexible metal that you could use to hold the panes of glass in place, would have been important for several reasons. One, you don't want them coming loose. And having the, the kind of plasticity of lead there would help. Number two, the actual panes of glass themselves were inconsistently sized. That is also one of the reasons why if you've ever had the good fortune to tour an older place that has 
old glass, old original glass in it. One of the ways you can tell it's old glass, usually, is because it has kind of a ripply effect to it. It's not perfectly flat. It's not perfectly smooth. It does warp your vision a little bit, which is fun, but would be truly annoying if you were, you know, an artist trying to draw out of your window during inclement weather when you can't go outside. That could get a little on the side of things. But the other inconsistency that you often see in these old, old casement windows and old, old glass is color. Sometimes the color was not particularly clear, and that would affect the amount of light that could come in, which also helped make these old Gothic places seem quite gloomy. So keep that in mind when you start hearing about windows. When we get to chapter 21, or volume 2, chapter 6, if you are following along in a book that has the volumes set out for you, there is yet another colloquialism, uh, just a phrasing of the time that we probably don't use anymore. Although if you do, I am fascinated. Please let me know at 206-350-1642. I would love to know if this is still language that you use. The language being, when Catherine gets in, she prepares to unpin the linen package. It may have been linen. It may have been another linen-esque kind of fabric. Either way, it would have been a, a relatively sturdy, relatively substantial piece of fabric that was pinned up and placed into the carriage with her, not into a packing case, not into her writing desk, not into a trunk that was strapped to the back of the carriages, but a package that was handed to her or carried by her that contained whatever she would need upon arrival. So whether it was a, another dress to wear or a hairbrush, a toothbrush, tooth powder, something like that, it would be those things that one might need right away, depending on what time you arrive at your destination. Basically a, a carry-on or an overnight bag, something that you would be able to carry by hand, but that you could prepack with, oh yeah, I'm going to need that when I get there, stuff. I believe we have come across the term Japan being used this way in a previous book, but I cannot for the life of me remember which book it was. Either way, we in the West had started to learn just a wee bit about Japan and that black lacquer, the beautiful black lacquer work that was famous for being something that was done in Japan. You are going to hear that lacquer work referred to as the cabinet was Japan, the same way you might say the cabinet was ebony or mahogany. So a Japan finish would be not a Japanese finish, and it, there's a reason why it's not Japanese. A Japan finish at this time would have been a black lacquer, usually, that thick lacquer that was inlaid with often gold or semi-precious stones, cut stones, things like that. This should probably be something that we have seen something like in our lifetime. Okay, here's where using the term Japan the way they do make sense. By this point in time, the point in time that this book is being written and consumed for the first time, there were people in Britain, craftsmen in Britain, who were making this same kind of lacquered finish themselves. Instead of referring only to things that came from Asia as Japan finish, anything that had that kind of black lacquer and inlaid finish was a Japan finish. So it wasn't Japanese imported. It was that finish that we all know that came from Japan. Okay, and the very last, I promise you, the very last thing that you need to know that everybody would have known back when this book was written is something that I completely misunderstood my entire life. Here we go. Heather is ashamed. Snuffing a candle. 
I had always thought that snuffing a candle was a single action by which one would take either a candle snuffer, the the little metal bell-shaped thing that you could place over an open flame on a candle, and by depriving the flame of oxygen, put it out, thus creating far less smoke or risk of burning wax being flung about by your breath than if you blew the candle out. So a candle snuffer seemed to me like a single action used in a specific way. Turns out that's not necessarily correct. There are evidently things called snuffing scissors. I knew that there were specialized scissors used for cutting and trimming wicks. I didn't understand the purpose behind the multiple steps involved with this. Here we go. Tallow candles. Tallow candles, which, and I'm going off the top of my head here, so I'm going to get part of this wrong. Please write in if you have made tallow candles and can share some information with the rest of us. Tallow candles, when they burned down, at least at this time, the wicks didn't evaporate into a puff of smoke as they burned. The wicks, as they burnt down, would leave kind of a curly bit that wasn't completely gone. As they burnt down, the longer that wick got, that was not moving or evaporating, the longer that wick got, the dimmer the candle got, at which point one would want to take out one's snuffing scissors and trim the wick. That would brighten the candle right back up again, and you would have enough light to see by. This kind of obviously presents several risks. One of those risks would be if you cut the wick too short because your hands are shaking, you would put out the candle because you would wind up with not enough exposed wick to burn. Everything would be below wax level, and that's a very hard candle to relight, especially if you don't have any matches in the room because you brought the candle up with you that had been lit with a rush light from a fireplace. So if you are in a situation like this, you have one other choice. If enough wick is exposed, just enough wick, it is possible that if you very carefully, very gently blow oh so gently on the wick, you can reignite that light. And that's all I'm going to tell you. All right. I promise you that was it. That was it. Let's listen now to chapters 20 and 21, or volume two, chapters five and six of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 20. Mr. and Mrs. Allen were sorry to lose their young friend, whose humour and cheerfulness had made her a valuable companion, and in the promotion of whose enjoyment their own had greatly been increased. Her happiness going with Miss Tilney, however, prevented their wishing it otherwise, and as they were to remain only one more week in Bath themselves, her quitting them now would not be long felt. Mr. Allen attended her to Milsom Street, where she was to breakfast, and saw her seated with the kindest welcome among her new friends. But so great was her agitation in finding herself as one of the family, and so fearful was she of not doing exactly what was right, and of not being able to preserve their good opinion, that in the embarrassment of that first five minutes she could almost have wished to return with him to Portney Street. Miss Tilney's manners and Henry's smile soon did away some of her unpleasant feelings, but still she was far from being at ease, nor could the incessant attentions of the general himself entirely reassure her. Nay, perverse as it seemed, she doubted whether she might not have felt less had she been less attended to. His anxiety for her comfort, his continual solicitations that she would eat, and his often expressed fears of her seeing nothing to her taste— though never in her life before had she beheld such a variety on a breakfast table, made it impossible for her to forget for a moment that she was a visitor. She felt utterly unworthy of such respect, and knew not how to reply to it. Her tranquillity was not improved by the general's impatience for the appearance of his eldest son, nor by the displeasure he expressed at his laziness when Captain Tilney at last came down. She was quite pained by the severity of his father's reproach, which seemed disproportionate to the offence, 
and much was her concern increased when she found herself the principal cause of the lecture, and that his tardiness was chiefly resented from being disrespectful to her. This was placing her in a very uncomfortable situation, and she felt great compassion for Captain Tilney without being able to hope for his good will. He listened to his father in silence, and attempted not any defence, which confirmed her in fearing that the inquietude of his mind, on Isabella's account, might, by keeping him long sleepless, have been the real cause of his rising late. It was the first time of her being decidedly in his company, and she had hoped to be now able to form her opinion of him, but she scarcely heard his voice while his father remained in the room, and even afterwards so much were his spirits affected, she could distinguish nothing but these words in a whisper to Eleanor, "'How glad I shall be when you are all off!' The bustle of going was not pleasant. The clock struck ten while the trunks were carried down, and the general had fixed up to be out of Milsom Street by that hour. His great coat, instead of being brought for him to be put on directly, was spread out in the curricle in which he was to accompany his son. The middle seat of the chaise was not drawn out, though there were three people to go in it, and his daughter's maid had so crowded it with parcels that Miss Morland would not have room to sit. And so much was he influenced by this apprehension when he handed her in, that she had some difficulty in saving her own new writing desk from being thrown out into the street. At last, however, the door was closed upon the three females, and they set off at the sober pace in which the handsome, highly fed four horses of a gentleman usually performed a journey of thirty miles. Such was the distance of Northanger from Bath, to be now divided into two equal stages. Catherine's spirits revived as they drove from the door, for with Miss Tilney she felt no restraint, and with the interest of the road entirely new to her, of an abbey before and the curricle behind, she caught the last view of Bath without any regret, and met with every milestone before she expected it. The tediousness of a two hours' wait at Petit France, in which there was nothing to be done but to eat without being hungry, and loiter about without anything to see, next followed, and her admiration of the style in which they travelled, of the fashionable chaise and four, postillions handsomely liveried, rising so regularly in their stirrups, and numerous outriders properly mounted, sunk a little under this consequent inconvenience. Had their party been perfectly agreeable, the delay would have been nothing. But General Tilney, though so charming a man, seemed always a check upon his children's spirits, and scarcely anything was said but by himself, the observation of which, with his discontent at whatever the inn afforded, and his angry impatience at the waiters, made Catherine grow every moment more in awe of him, and appeared to lengthen the two hours into four. At last, however, the order of release was given, and much was Catherine then surprised by the general's proposal of her taking his place in his son's curricle for the rest of the journey. The day was fine, and he was anxious for her seeing as much of the country as possible. The remembrance of Mr. Allen's opinion respecting young men's open carriages made her blush at the mention of such a plan, and her first thought was to decline it. But her second was of greater deference for General Tilney's judgment. He could not propose anything improper for her— and in the course of a few minutes she found herself with Henry in the curricle, as happy a being as ever existed. A very short trial convinced her that a curricle was the prettiest equipage in the world. The chaise and four wheeled off with some grandeur, to be sure, but it was a heavy and troublesome business, and she could not easily forget its having stopped two hours at Petit France. Half the time would have been enough for the curricle, and so nimbly were the light horses disposed to move, that had not the general chosen to have his own carriage lead the way, they could have passed it with ease in half a minute. But the merit of the curricle did not all belong to the horses. Henry drove so well, so quietly, without making any disturbance, without parading to her or swearing at them, so different from the only gentleman coachman who it was in her power to compare him with. And then his hat sat so well, and the innumerable capes of his great coat looked so becomingly important. To be driven by him, next to being dancing with him, was certainly the greatest happiness in the world. In addition to every other delight, she had now that of listening to her own praise, of being thanked at least on his sister's account for her kindness in thus becoming her visitor, of hearing it ranked as real friendship and described as creating real gratitude. His sister, he said, was uncomfortably circumstanced. 
She had no female companion, and in the frequent absence of her father was sometimes without any companion at all. But how can that be? said Catherine. Are you not with her? Northanger is not more than half my home. I have an establishment at my own house in Woodston, which is nearly twenty miles from my father's, and some of my time is necessarily spent there. How sorry you must be for that! I am always sorry to leave Eleanor. Yes, but besides your affection for her, you must be so fond of the Abbey. After being used to such a home as the Abbey, an ordinary parsonage house must be very disagreeable. He smiled and said, you have formed a very favourable idea of the Abbey. To be sure I have. Is it not a fine old place, just like what one reads about? And are you prepared to encounter all the horrors that a building such as what one reads about may produce? Have you a stout heart, nerves fit for sliding panels and tapestry? Oh, yes, I do not think I should be easily frightened, because there will be so many people in the house. And besides, it's never been uninhabited and left deserted for years, and then the family come back to it unawares without giving any notice, as generally happens. No, certainly. We shall not have to explore our way into a hall dimly lighted by the expiring embers of a wood fire, nor be obliged to spread our beds on the floor of a room without windows, doors or furniture. But you must be aware that when a young lady is, by whatever means, introduced into a dwelling of this kind, she is always lodged apart from the rest of the family. While they snugly repair to their own end of the house, she is formally conducted by Dorothy, the ancient housekeeper, up a different staircase and along many gloomy passages into an apartment never used since some cousin of kin died in it about twenty years before. Can you stand such a ceremony as this? will not your mind misgive you? When you find yourself in this gloomy chamber, too lofty and extensive for you, with only the feeble rays of a single lamp to take in its size, its walls hung with tapestries exhibiting figures as large as life, and the bed of dark green stuff or purple velvet presenting every funeral appearance, will not your heart sink within you? Oh, but this will not happen to me, I'm sure! How dreadfully will you examine the furniture of your apartment, and what will you discern? Not tables, toilettes, wardrobes or drawers, but on one side perhaps the remains of a broken lute, and on the other a ponderous chest which no efforts can open, and over the fireplace the portrait of some handsome warrior whose features will so incomprehensibly strike you that you will not be able to withdraw your eyes from it. Dorothy, meanwhile, no less struck by your appearance, gazes on you in great agitation and drops a few unintelligible hints. To raise your spirits, moreover, she gives you reason to suppose that the part of the abbey where you inhabit is undoubtedly haunted and informs you that you will not have a single domestic within call. With this parting cordial she curtsies off. You listen to the sound of her receding footsteps as long as the last echo can reach you. And when, with fainting spirits, you attempt to fasten your door, you discover with increasing alarm that it has no lock. Oh, Mr. Tilney, how frightful! This is just like a book. But it cannot really happen to me. I'm sure your housekeeper is not really Dorothy. Well, what then? Nothing farther to alarm, perhaps, may occur on the first night. After surmounting your unconquerable horror of the bed, you will retire to rest and get a few hours' unquiet slumber. But on the second, or at farthest, the third night after your arrival, you will probably have a violent storm, peals of thunder so loud as to seem to shake the edifice to its foundation will roll round the neighbouring mountains, and during the frightful gusts of wind which accompany it, you will probably think you discern, for your lamp is not extinguished, one part of the hanging more violently agitated than the rest. Unable, of course, to repress your curiosity in so favourable a moment for indulging it, you will instantly arise, and throwing your dressing gown around you, proceed to examine this mystery. After a very short search, you will discover a division in the tapestry, so artfully constructed as to defy the minutest inspection, and upon opening it, a door will immediately appear which door being only secured by massy bars and a padlock, you will, after a few efforts, succeed in opening, and with your lamp in your hand will pass through it into a small vaulted room. No, indeed, I should be too much frightened to do any such thing. What? 
Not when Dorothy has given you to understand that there is a secret subterraneous communication between your apartment and the chapel of St. Anthony, scarcely two miles off. Could you shrink from so simple an adventure? No, no, you will proceed into this small vaulted room and through thus into several others without perceiving anything very remarkable in either. In one, perhaps, there may be a dagger, in another, a few drops of blood, and in a third, the remains of some instrument of torture. But there be nothing in all this out of the common way. Your lamp being nearly extinguished, you will return towards your own apartment. In repassing through the small vaulted room, however, your eyes will be attracted towards a large old-fashioned cabinet of ebony and gold, which, though narrowly examining the furniture before, you had passed unnoticed. Impelled by an irresistible presentment, you will eagerly advance to it, unlock its folding doors, and search into every drawer. But for some time without discovering anything of importance, perhaps nothing but a considerable hoard of diamonds. At last, however, by touching a secret spring, an inner compartment will open. A roll of paper appears. You seize it. It contains many sheets of manuscript. You hasten with the precious treasures into your own chamber, but scarcely have you been able to decipher, O oh, thou whomsoever thou may be, in whose hands these memoirs of the wretched Matilda may fall, when your lamp suddenly expires in the socket and leaves you in total darkness. Oh, no, no, do not say so. Well, go on. But Henry was too much amused by the interest he'd raised to be able to carry it farther. He could no longer command solemnity either of subject or voice, and was obliged to entreat her to use her own fancy in the perusal of Matilda's woes. Catherine, recollecting herself, grew ashamed of her eagerness, and began earnestly to assure him that her attention had been fixed without the smallest apprehension of really meeting with what he related. Miss Tilney, she was sure, would never put her into such a chamber as he had described. She was not at all afraid. As they drew near the end of their journey, her impatience for a sight of the abbey, for some time suspended by his conversation on all subjects very different, returned in full force, and every bend in the road was expected, with solemn awe, to afford a glimpse of its massy walls of grey stone, rising amidst a grove of ancient oaks, with the last beams of the sun playing in beautiful splendour on its high Gothic windows. But so low did the building stand that she found herself passing through the great gates of the lodge into the very grounds of Northanger without having discerned even an antique chimney. She knew not that she had any right to be surprised, but there was something in this mode of approach which she certainly had not expected. To pass between lodges of a modern appearance, to find herself with such ease in the very precincts of the abbey, and driven so rapidly along a smooth level road of fine gravel, without obstacle alarm or solemnity of any kind, struck her as odd and inconsistent. She was not long at leisure, however, for such considerations. A sudden scud of rain, driving full in her face, made it impossible for her to observe anything further, and fixed all her thoughts on the welfare of her new straw bonnet and she was actually under the abbey walls, was springing, with Henry's assistance, from the carriage, was beneath the shelter of the old porch, and had even passed on to the hall, where her friend and the general were waiting to welcome her, without feeling one awful foreboding of future misery to herself, or the one moment suspicion of any past scenes of horror being acted within the solemn edifice. The breeze had not seemed to waft the sights of the murderer to her. It had wafted nothing worse than a thick, mizzling rain, and having given a good shake to her habit, she was ready to be shown into the common drawing-room, and capable of considering where she was. An abbey. Yes, it was delightful to be really in an abbey. But she doubted, as she looked round the room, whether anything within her observation would have given her the consciousness. The furniture was in all the profusion and elegance of modern taste. The fireplace, where she had expected the ample and ponderous carving of former times, was contracted to a rumford, with slabs of plain though handsome marble, and ornaments over it of the prettiest English china. The windows, to which she looked with particular dependence, from having heard the general talk of his preserving them in their gothic form with reverential care, were yet less what her fancy had portrayed. To be sure, the pointed arch was preserved, the form of them was gothic, they might even be casements, but every pane was so large and clear, so light. 
to an imagination which had hoped for the smallest divisions and the heaviest stonework, for painted glass, dirt and cobwebs, the difference was very distressing. The general, perceiving how her eye was employed, began to talk of the smallness of the room and simplicity of the furniture, where everything being for daily use pretended only to comfort, etc., flattering himself, however, that there were some apartments in the abbey not unworthy her notice, and was proceeding to mention the costly gilding of one in particular, when, taking out his watch, he stopped short to pronounce it with surprise within twenty minutes of five. This seemed the word of separation, and Catherine found herself hurried away by Miss Tilney in such a manner as convinced her that the strictest punctuality to the family hours would be expected at Northanger. Returning through the large and lofty hall, they ascended a broad staircase of shining oak, which, after many flights and many landing places, brought them upon a long, wide gallery. On one side it had a range of doors, and it was lighted on the other by windows which Catherine had only time to discover looked into a quadrangle, before Miss Tilney led the way into a chamber, and scarcely staying to hope she would find it comfortable, left her with an anxious entreaty that she would make as little alteration as possible in her dress. Chapter 21 A moment's glance was enough to satisfy Catherine that her apartment was very unlike the one which Henry had endeavoured to alarm her by the description of. It was by no means unreasonably large, and contained neither tapestry nor velvet. The walls were papered, the floor was carpeted, and the windows were neither less perfect nor more dim than those of the drawing-room below. The furniture, though not of the latest fashion, was handsome and comfortable, and the air of the room altogether far from uncheerful. Her heart instantaneously at ease on this point, she resolved to lose no time in particular examination of anything, as she greatly dreaded disobliging the general by any delay. Her habit, therefore, was thrown off with all possible haste, and she was preparing to unpin the linen package which the chaise seat had conveyed for her immediate accommodation, when her eye suddenly fell on a large high chest, standing back in a deep recess on one side of the fireplace. The sight of it made her start, and forgetting everything else, she stood gazing on it in motionless wonder, while these thoughts crossed her. "'This is strange indeed. I did not expect such a sight as this.' "'An immense heavy chest. What can it hold? Why should it be placed here? Pushed back, too, as if meant to be out of sight. I will look into it. Cost me what it may. I will look into it, and directly, too, by daylight. If I stay till the evening, my candle may go out.' She advanced and examined it closely. It was cedar, curiously inlaid with some darker wood, and raised about a foot from the ground on a carved stand of the same. The lock was silver, though tarnished from age, and at each end were the imperfect remains of handles, also silver, broken perhaps prematurely by some strange violence, and on the centre of the lid was a mysterious cipher in the same metal. Catherine bent over it intently, but without being able to distinguish anything with certainty. She could not, in whatever direction she took it, believe the last letter to be a T, and yet that it should be anything else in that house was a circumstance to raise no common degree of astonishment. If not originally theirs, by what strange events could it have fallen into the Tilney family? Her fearful curiosity was every moment growing greater, and seizing with trembling hands the clasp of the lock, she resolved at all hazards to satisfy herself at least as to its contents. With difficulty, for something seemed to resist her efforts, she raised the lid a few inches. But at that moment a sudden knocking at the door of the room made her starting, quit her hold, and the lid closed with alarming violence. This ill-timed intruder was Miss Tilney's maid, sent by her mistress to be of use to Miss Morland, and though Catherine immediately dismissed her, it recalled her to the sense of what she ought to be doing, and forced her, in spite of her anxious desire to penetrate this mystery, to proceed in her dressing without further delay. Her progress was not quick, for her thoughts and her eyes were still bent on the object so well calculated to interest and alarm, and though she dared not waste a moment upon a second attempt, she could not remain many paces from the chest. At length, however, having slipped one arm into her gown, her toilet seemed so nearly finished that the impatience of her curiosity might safely be indulged. One moment surely might be spared, and so desperate should be the exertion of her strength, that unless secured by supernatural means, the lid in one moment should be thrown back. With this spirit she sprang forward, and her confidence did not deceive her. 
her resolute effort threw back the lid and gave to her astonished eyes the view of a white cotton counterpane properly folded reposing at one end of the chest in undisputed possession. She was gazing on it with a first blush of surprise when Miss Tilney, anxious for her friends being ready, entered the room, and to the rising shame of having harboured for some minutes an absurd expectation was then added to the shame of being caught in so idle a search. "'That is a curious old chest, is it not?' said Miss Tilney, as Catherine hastily closed it and turned away to the glass. "'It is impossible to say how many generations it's been here. How it came to be first put in this room I know not, but I've not had it moved because I thought it might sometimes be of use in holding hats and bonnets. The worst of it is that its weight makes it difficult to open. In that corner, however, it's at least out of the way.' Catherine had no leisure for speech, being at once blushing, trying her gown, and forming wide resolutions with a most violent dispatch. Miss Tilney gently hinted her fear of being late, and in half a minute they ran downstairs together, in an alarm not wholly unfounded, for General Tilney was pacing in the drawing-room, his watch in his hand, and having, on the very instant of their entering, pulled the bell with violence, ordered dinner to be on the table directly. Catherine trembled at the emphasis which she spoke, and sat pale and breathless, in a most humble mood, concerned for his children in detesting old chests, and the general, recovering his politeness as he looked at her, spent the rest of his time in scolding his daughter for so foolishly hurrying her fair friend, who was absolutely out of breath from haste, when there was not the least occasion for hurry in the world. But Catherine could not at all get over the double distress of having involved her friend in a lecture and been a great simpleton herself, till they were happily seated at the dinner-table, where the general's complacent smiles and a good appetite of her own restored her to peace. The dining-parlour was a noble room, suitable in its dimensions to a much larger drawing-room than the one in common use, and fitted up in a style of luxury and expense which was almost lost on the unpractised eye of Catherine, who saw little more than its spaciousness and the number of their attendants. On the former she spoke her loud admiration, and the general, with a very gracious countenance, acknowledged that it was by no means an ill-sized room, and further confessed that, though as careless on such subjects as most people, he did look upon a tolerably large eating-room as one of the necessities of life. He supposed, however, that she must have been used to better-sized apartments at Mr. Allen's. "'No, indeed!' was Catherine's honest assurance. Mr. Allen's dining parlour was not more than half as large, and she had never seen so large a room as this in her life. The general's good humour increased. Why, as he had such rooms, he thought it would be simple not to make use of them. But upon his honour he believed there might be more comfort in rooms of only half their size. Mr. Allen's house, he was sure, must be exactly of the true size for rational happiness. The evening passed without any further disturbance, and in the occasional absence of General Tilney, with much positive cheerfulness. It was only in his presence that Catherine felt the smallest fatigue from her journey, and even then, even in moments of languor or restraint, a sense of general happiness preponderated, and she could think of her friends in Bath without one wish of being with them. The night was stormy, the wind had been rising at intervals the whole afternoon, and by the time the party broke up it blew and rained violently. Catherine, as she crossed the hall, listened to the tempest with sensations of awe. When she heard it rage round the corner of the ancient building and close with a sudden fury at a distant door, felt for the first time that she was really in an abbey. Yes, these were the characteristic sounds. They brought to her recollection a countless variety of dreadful situations and horrid scenes which such buildings had witnessed and such storms ushered in and most heartily did she rejoice in happier circumstances attending her entrance within the walls so solemn. She had nothing to dread from midnight assassins or drunken gallants. Henry had certainly been only in jest in what he had told her that morning. In a house so furnished and so guarded, she could have nothing to explore or to suffer, and might go to her bedroom as securely as if it had been her own chamber at Fullerton. Thus, wisely fortifying her mind as she proceeded upstairs, she was enabled, especially on perceiving that Miss Tilney slept only two doors from her, to enter her room with a tolerably stout heart, and her spirits were immediately assisted by the cheerful blaze of a wood fire. "'How much better is this?' 
she said as she walked to the fender. How much better to find a fire ready lit than to have to wait shivering in the cold till all the family are in bed, as so many poor girls have been obliged to do, and then to have a faithful old servant frightening one by coming in with a faggot. How glad I am that North Hungary is what it is. If it had been like some other places, I do not know that in such a night as this I could have answered for my courage. But now, to be sure, there's nothing to alarm one. She looked round the room. The window curtains seemed in motion. It could be nothing but the violence of the wind penetrating through the divisions of the shutters. She stepped boldly forward, carelessly humming a tune to assure herself of its being so, peeped courageously behind each curtain, saw nothing on either low window seat to scare her, and, on placing a hand against the shutter, felt the strongest conviction of the wind's force. A glance at the old chest, as she turned away from this examination, was not without its use. She scorned the causeless fears of an idle fancy, and began, with the most happy indifference, to prepare herself for bed. She should take her time. She should not hurry herself. She did not care if she were the last person up in that house. But she would not make up her fire. That would seem cowardly, as if she wished for the protection of light after she were in bed. The fire therefore died away, and Catherine, having spent the best part of an hour in her arrangements, was beginning to think of stepping into bed, when, on giving a parting glance round the room, she was struck by the appearance of a high, old-fashioned black cabinet, which, though in a situation conspicuous enough, had never caused her to notice before. Henry's words, the description of the ebony cabinet which was to escape her observation at first, immediately rushed across her and though there could be nothing really in it there was something whimsical it was certainly a very remarkable coincidence she took her candle and looked closely at the cabinet it was not absolutely ebony and gold but it was japan black and yellow japan of the handsomest kind and as she held her candle the yellow had very much the effect of gold the key was in the door and she had a strange fancy to look into it not, however, with the smallest expectation of finding anything, but it was so very odd after what Henry had said. In short, she could not sleep till she had examined it. So placing the candle with great caution on a chair, she seized the key, and with a very tremulous hand, tried to turn it. But it resisted her utmost strength. Alarmed but not discouraged, she tried another way. A bolt flew, and she believed herself successful. But how strangely mysterious! The door was still immovable. She paused a moment in a breathless wonder. The wind roared down the chimney, the rain beat in torrents against the windows, and everything seemed to speak of the awfulness of her situation. To retire to bed, however, unsatisfied on such a point, would be in vain, since sleep must be impossible with the consciousness of a cabinet so mysteriously closed in her immediate vicinity. Again, therefore, she applied herself to the key, and after moving it in every possible way, for some instance with the determined celerity of Hope's last effort, the door suddenly yielded to her hand. Her heart leaped with exultation at such a victory, and having thrown open each folding door, the second being secured only by bolts of less wonderful construction than the lock, though in that her eye could discern anything unusual, a double range of small drawers appeared in view, with some larger drawers above and below them, and in the centre a small door, closed also with a lock and key, secured in all probability a cavity of importance. Catherine's heart beat quick, but her courage did not fail her. With a cheek flushed by hope and an eye straining with curiosity, her fingers grasped at the handle of a drawer and drew it forth. It was entirely empty. With less alarm and greater eagerness she seized a second, a third, a fourth. Each was equally empty. Not one was left unsearched, and in not one was anything found. Well read in the art of concealing a treasure, the possibility of false linings to the drawers did not escape her, and she felt round each with anxious acuteness in vain. The place in the middle alone remained now unexplored, and though she had never from the first had the smallest idea of finding anything in any part of the cabinet, and was not in the least disappointed at her ill success thus far, it would be foolish not to examine it thoroughly while she was about it. It was some time, however, before she could unfasten the door, the same difficulty occurring in the management of this inner lock as of the outer, but at length it did open, and not in vain as hitherto was her search. 
Her quick eyes directly fell on a roll of paper pushed back into the further part of the cavity, apparently for concealment, and her feelings at that moment were indescribable. Her heart fluttered, her knees trembled, her cheeks grew pale. She seized with an unsteady hand the precious manuscript. For half a glance sufficed to ascertain the written characters, and while she acknowledged with awful sensation this striking exemplification of what Henry had foretold, resolved instantly to peruse every line before she attempted to rest. The dimness of the light her candle emitted made her turn to it with alarm, but there was no danger of its sudden extinction. It had yet some hours to burn, and that she might not have any greater difficulty in distinguishing the writing than what its ancient date might occasion, she hastily snuffed it. Alas, it was snuffed and extinguished in one. A lamp could not have expired with more awful effect. Catherine, for a few moments, was motionless with horror. It was done completely. Not a remnant of light in the wick could give hope of a rekindling breath. Darkness, impenetrable and immovable, filled the room. A violent gust of wind, rising with sudden fury, added fresh horror to the moment. Catherine trembled from head to foot. In the pause which succeeded, a sound like receding footsteps and the closing of a distant door struck on her affrighted ear. Human nature could support no more. A cold sweat stood on her forehead. The manuscript fell from her hand, and groping her way to the bed, she jumped hastily in, and sought some suspensions of agony by creeping far underneath the clothes. To close her eyes in sleep that night, she felt, must be entirely out of the question. With a curiosity so justly awakened, and feelings in every way so agitated, repose must be absolutely impossible. The storm, too, abroad so dreadful. She had not been used to feel alarm from wind, but now every blast seemed fraught with awful intelligence. The manuscript, so wonderfully found, so wonderfully accomplishing the morning's prediction, how was that to be accounted for? What could it contain? To whom could it relate? By what means could it have been so long concealed? And how singularly strange that it should then fall to her lot to discover it! Till she had made herself mistress of its contents, however, she could have neither repose nor comfort. But with the sun's first rays, she was determined to peruse it. But many were the tedious hours which must yet intervene. She shuddered, tossed about in her bed, and envied every quiet sleeper. The storm still raged, and various were the noises, more terrific even than the wind which struck at intervals on her startled ear. The very curtains of her bed seemed at one moment in motion, and at another the lock of her door was agitated, as if by the attempt of someone to enter. Hollow murmurs seemed to creep along the gallery, and more than once her blood was chilled by the sound of distant moans. Hour after hour passed away, and the wearied Catherine had heard three proclaimed by all the clocks in the house before the tempest subsided, or she unknowingly fell fast asleep. All right. So, so, oh, Catherine, that was the best end. <laughs> and it was going to be really intense. And it was, everything's good. And oh my God. And then she fell asleep. The end. You're welcome. Thank you, Jane Austen. So, first off, Henry Tilney got his imagination on. Boy proved his Udolfo chops. I didn't bother going into the 7,000 footnotes and annotations that I have access to, where every single thing that Henry Tilney said sub-referenced one of our gothic novels of the day. Usually Mysteries of Udolpho, but not only. It's, it was clear that Jane Austen read very widely in that genre. So that's fun. And if you've read any of those books, first, God bless you. Second, you picked up on a lot of inside jokes. And I can just, I guarantee you, I promise you, any specific, whether it was a chest or velvet or green stuff or whatever, that was drawn very specifically from a gothic novel of the time. So Henry Tilney, yay. And General Tilney, interesting. That was one of the few times where I thought, yeah, you know, if these were real people, I actually don't know that General Tilney would have put her up front with his son, who he knows she's been dancing with. I don't know. That seems a little 
eh, of course, he's a tall man, so he probably could see out of the chaise to still be observant. That's probably true. He'd probably be able to make sure that they weren't up to any monkey business. Not that if I knew Catherine, I wouldn't expect her to be up to any monkey business either because she's Catherine. So it's probably fine. Either way, it was very lovely of him to put her up out of kind of the, the bucket seat, the carriage hole <laughs> that she was riding in, uh, put her up where she could see the countryside as she approaches Northanger Abbey. And of course, the general does want to show off a bit, you know, just a bit to her as well. We did learn some important things about Henry. His home is not Northanger Abbey. He has his own place in Woodston, which is not far away. And he must have a curate. He must have hired somebody to help him out with his position as the vicar in that particular town. This is exactly what Papa Bronte did eventually. He finally had enough money that he could hire a curate. And, uh, and the curate, eventually one of the curates, is the gentleman who Charlotte Bronte married and who she was going to raise a family with before she died while she was pregnant. Sorry to bring it down there. Either way, curate, happy. That's a happy thing. It means Henry has a little bit more time on his hands. If it makes you think that he must therefore be a frivolous person, if you've read the Wild Nights on the Moors story of the Brontes book, it's pretty clear that the amount of work that a clergyman had to do at this time went way beyond writing a sermon for Sunday. Depending on how large the area was, there was more than enough to keep you busy between weddings, births, and deaths. You were hopping pretty constantly, not to mention that you're kind of the spiritual leader of the community and there's just ministering to people that you're expected to do, as well as keep the place up, plan for the holidays, plan for your Sunday sermons, remembering that Sunday is not just a one-hour sermon with a service that is rote. It is all day Sunday. So having a curate is not just, I want to go be an idle rich boy and have somebody else do my job for me. Henry's being responsible. Another thing that I didn't bother to point out before, but when they're driving up to Northanger Abbey for the first time, the narrator points out that they are driving on a gravel drive. This was actually kind of new at this point, at the, the turn of the, the 18th century. Not so much the gravel drives before that. So that was yet another way that this was not quite the Gothic Abbey that Catherine was probably hoping for, but far more comfortable, <laughs> far more modern, far more up-to-date, not so much the shoddy Gothic wonder that Catherine may have been dreaming of. Now, I promised you some fun about Rumford's. <laughs> All right, so Sir Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, by August 1796, Coleridge, the Xanadu, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Coleridge, had turned the name Rumford, as in a Rumford fireplace, he had turned it into a verb. And this is a quote, the landlord has promised me to Rumfordize the chimneys, he wrote to a friend. And then in a letter to the editor of the Morning Chronicle on C. Cole, S-E-A-C-O-A-L, and sensibility, C. Cole and sensibility, haha, <laughs> this is September 1801, he tendered a metaphoric upgrade. We should Rumfordize our feelings in such a manner as to be able to vie with our wooden-fueled neighbors in sensibility. It allowed a Rumford fireplace would allow you to burn coal as well as firewood. The concentrated space made coal a little bit more functional, just like putting coal in a grate or into something like a Franklin stove. However, there's even more than just that. There is an etching of the day by James Gilray, G I L L R A Y, and the etching is called. The Comforts of a Rumford Stove. It's an etching with watercolor. It was published in 1800, and it is, it's, 
as it's put here. It features Rumford himself toasting his buns <laughs> by standing in front of this marble-faced fireplace, very small fireplace. The satirist Peter Pindar soon after hailed this genius of home heating in a 27-page tribute in neoclassical couplets, and I will read you a few. Muse, at the sound of Rumford, raise thy voice, and bid our kitchen furniture rejoice. Lo, every parlor drawing room I see boasts of thy stoves and talks of naught but thee. <laughs> and there were reviews of the reviews of these both etching and um, and these 27 pages of rhyming couplets all about a fireplace. You're welcome. On that note, I leave you. Have a great week. Be well. Be safe. Get a vaccination. Wear a mask. Take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Be well. Bye. Episode 557, The Dangers of Reading Too Much. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am recording again. Yay. I'm so sorry that, if you're listening in real time, that the last two Fridays got away from me. The first one was because my mom was here. That is correct. We had an actual human person who hasn't been here for the last year walk into the house on purpose and stay. My mom is fully vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. Andrew is now fully vaccinated. And on Monday, both boys will be fully vaccinated. We have not done the dog or the cat. <laughs> You're not supposed to do the dog or the cat. It's a huge relief. I have once gone into a restaurant with a very high ceiling and eaten food there and lived to tell the tale. So that's awesome. It's just, it's weirdly not weird. You know, you, you kind of have the moment of transition. Like I'm walking into a place that, a kind of place that I haven't walked into in a year. And then once you're in there, everything seems really normal until you start to notice the people who do and don't have masks on. And it's, it reminds you of uh, of reality, or at least it did it did for me. But I'm expecting to find out in the next couple months when I will need to get a booster shot because I got Pfizer, Andrew got Moderna, and boys got Pfizer. So so yeah, we're a petri dish family <laughs> on the vaccine front. <laughs> but that's all. That was wonderful. My mom and I got to go up to Bethlehem, where Steele was born. <laughs> Different birth in this Bethlehem. We got to go to Steel Stacks, which is uh, the Bethlehem Steel Company. They've built uh, an exterior trestle so you can walk along. If they've reopened it, uh, you can walk along and look at all the rusting steel works. And they've put historical, or as my dad used to say, hysterical markers along the trestle to, so that you know what you're looking at. Things like, and factoids like, let's see, my favorite one, I think, was during World War II. So this would have been during 1944. They put out one U.S. naval ship a day, which is kind of impressive. The machine shop is three quarters of a mile long, and it's machine shop number two, and it is still there. And all of this is derelict. It's just sitting there. But in this one location, they have a visitor center, which was back open again, but we couldn't get into it because one of the high schools was hosting their prom at the steel stacks, which is really actually, it sounds odd, but they light them up at night and they're really quite beautiful. And so it, it was an outdoor prom venue. And I thought that was some smart local thinking there is what that was. That was lovely. So we had a great day. We went back into Bethlehem proper. We got some actually really good made, homemade ice cream. And, um, and then mom went on her merry way. So things we got to do that weren't Heather-centric. <laughs> My mom got to see uh, Thing 2 in Godspell. So live theater. The school auditorium is so massive that uh, the seating for the auditorium is so massive that they were able to space family pods out. So it was the first time we had assigned seating. And it was 
quite lovely and everything was fine. The first night we were sitting in the back and I was good with that. Uh, I'll tell you, I had a hard time after the show on Saturday and here's why. You go to the show, get your ticket, you go in, you get your seat. Everybody's got masks on. Show's good. They did very smart things with the, the kids and masks. It was really lovely. And of course, the music's all wonderful. And then the show ends and everybody gets up and starts milling around and congregating. And I've been living inside by myself <laughs> in the basement pretty much for a year. And I was not expecting to get hit with a wave of anxiety. Um, it wasn't a panic attack. It was just one of those, I don't really know how to do this anymore. The social congregating thing and just talking to people. I find it very difficult to hear in large noisy rooms. And if I can't see your lips, I can't lip read. And that, that also makes me very uncomfortable. It was really hard. And finally, Andrew was across the theater talking to some people. And I just texted him and said, I can't do this. I'm going to go outside. And I did. And I went outside and I sat down and I sketched for a little while. And then he came out and then it was fine. And yet the following Tuesday, a few of the mom squad and I worked the polls for the election. And it was totally fine because there I had a job and a purpose and I knew how to do what I was doing. So I don't know if anybody else has experienced this. It was very strange for me. And I don't know if that's going to be the only time that happens or if that's going to keep happening. But something odd for the end of the pandemic or the, the end of phase one of the pandemic, I guess. The other thing my mom got to do was we went up to Hellerstown on the way to Bethlehem. And in Hellerstown is the Lost River Cavern where Aaron is a tour guide for the next couple of weeks still. And then he's going to go back to Philadelphia and back to university. But my mom got to see Aaron give a tour and got to hear the boss, not knowing that we were there, telling a previous tour group that they had gotten their best guide and it was Aaron. So he actually has really good reviews on Google too. It's just a hoot. And he gets his, his tour guide voice on and it's just fun. It's fun. It's fun to watch your kid being an expert in something. And he really does know all sorts of weird, funky things about this, this little family owned cavern. So, so that's my life. I've caught you up. Our contract is ending June 19th. And so everything is slowing down in the training of contact tracers, which is not a surprise. So I shouldn't have uh, too many things getting in the way of me recording for the foreseeable future. And on that note, let's dive into Northanger Abbey. When last we saw Catherine, she had worked herself into a tizzy and then gone to sleep. She had worked herself into a tizzy about the papers and the bedroom and the storm. And you are going to see Jane Austen continue in the next two chapters that we're doing today, 22 and 23 today. You will see her continuing to ridicule, satirize, make fun of giggle at all things gothic. So if you hear a point being made about something like last week was the, the windows, you can be guaranteed that it is because that's a gothic element. The other thing that's happening at the same time, however, is we, we had the gothic movement. The gothic movement is now moving into the romantic capital R movement. So if you listen to Frankenstein, you have a lot of background on the romantics and you know that things like storms and the nature, capital N, and Byronic heroes, of which I would put Henry's older brother into that category. That sentence made no sense. Henry's older brother is a Byronic hero. <laughs> or, or maybe not a hero. I don't know. He's, we don't know him very well yet, but he seems like a bit of a rapscallion to me. We do have some uh, language and some setups that I need to tell you about in advance. However, there are several things that I don't want to spoil for you. They don't seem like that big a deal, but I feel like it would be front-loading a little bit too much information, which I know sounds so strange for me to say, but I actually did think, eh, that one I can save till the end. But things to know in advance. 
a breeches ball. Breeches as in breeches pants, ball as in ball of soap. You have seen, I'm sure, at some point in your life, handmade soap balls. This was like that. A lot of soap at the time contained very harsh things like lye in them. And so if you had expensive breeches, like silk or satin ones, they would be expensive, they would be delicate, you would not want to use harsh soaps on them. And so a breeches ball was a ball of soap that was very mild and was designed to be used on more delicate fabrics. I didn't know that at all. Ha ha. And not only that, but I heard brick bats being used on the Nevers on HBO. And I thought, oh, brick bats. We learned what those are. So there you go. Craft lit in the now. A farrier, not furrier, not F-U-R, but F-A-R. F-A-R-R-I-E-R was someone who both shod and who treated the ailments of horses, which I didn't know that they did treatments, but I did know they did shodding, <laughs> shoeing. Hyacinths, the flower. Yes, the flower. Hyacinths as flowers were brought to Europe in the 16th century. During the 18th century, they became really popular. And one of the reasons that they became popular is because they figured out how to force bulbs in very pretty glass containers. And so people were very fond of putting the bulbs into their homes. So these are flowers that could do very well outdoors in certain climates, but they did really well indoors in England. And so hyacinths were a thing. Like, uh, I suppose, like orchids are now for people who are good good with plants and not named Heather. <laughs> breakfast set. We have encountered this kind of thing before and talked about it before as well. A breakfast set would have been, still is, uh, a set of dishes that were, and I'm using air quotes, designed to be used at breakfast. That doesn't mean much. They are still just plates and bowls and saucers and cups and a creamer, you know, things like that, a teapot, a creamer, a coffee pot. However, they are called a breakfast set as a keeping up with the Joneses thing. The middle class is on the rise. The nouveau riche are on the tail of the well-to-do. And of course, the well-to-do need to show that they are considerably better than everyone else. And therefore, they can afford a breakfast set. They buy a breakfast set. They are shocked and look askance at anyone who can't buy a breakfast set. Oh, I, I guess we'll just use the regular dishes. Certainly, I'll be fine with that. It's not a problem at all. But you will hear a breakfast set being discussed. And along with that breakfast set, I think I mentioned it last week because it's, it's coming up again. Staffordshire had become the center of UK-China production and... They were still kind of up and coming at the time. Uh, most of the, the really expensive China had been made uh, in China, actually, but it was harder to import. And then in Europe, there were a couple of uh, locations, Dresden, not surprising, and Sèvres or Sèvres, and I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. Wedgwood China was made in Staffordshire. That was definitely on the rise at this time including bone china. And the reason bone china was, cons it wasn't considered delicate. It is delicate. I did not know this. Ground up, dried ground up bone meal, bone, very, very finely ground up bone made part of the china, the, the porcelain that they're making the china out of, and it made it less expensive. So the British production was able to both outpace and eventually out finely produce uh, some of the other Chinas. So, learn something new every day. You will hear the term plantation, and unlike what that evokes if you grew up in the United States of a southern plantation, here when you hear the phrase a treed plantation or plantation of trees, what they're talking about is if you have the acreage and you have, you know, your, your large open field and you have your little wooded glens where you have built your hermit's cottage. You also might have greenhouses and hothouses and, and perhaps a plantation. And that would be where you have planted trees on purpose, sometimes for the purpose of creating your own lumber. 
and sometimes for the purpose of, you know, fruit or whatever. But planted, purposefully planted trees are a plantation, which makes perfect sense to me. I had actually never thought about it that way before. However, because my vision of plantation and south is so dominant an image with when you combine the word plantation with all of the images that that evokes from the beginning of this country. So nice to know. Garden walls. There's an odd reference in chapter 22 to garden walls. And it's not such a big deal, but it is something that I didn't know. Garden walls could be constructed, were constructed specifically for the purpose of protecting fragile plants from weather. So you wouldn't like put a roof on it or anything. It's specifically to protect them from very cold wind that would typically come in from a particular direction. And so you could kind of contain the plants on two sides and protect them from uh, from that harsh weather. You could also, therefore, if that was made of brick or stone, you could, and they usually were, you could put a brazier next to the wall and heat the wall. Sometimes the fragile plants were planted next to the wall of a house where there was a chimney, and you would use the heat that was escaping outside of the house to keep the plants warm when they needed to be kept warm. I thought that was interesting too. A hobby horse. A hobby horse is a hobby or a pastime. It was just a, a colloquial phrase of the time and is used evidently all over Tristram Shandy, which I know at some point I'll figure out how to do that book. I, I still don't know how, but we'll get there. You can probably already tell we're going to visit the gardens. Uh, you can definitely tell after this. A, a pinery, P-I-N-E-R-Y, is where you grow pineapples. You're welcome. Succession houses would be Greenhouses that are heated to temperatures so that if you move plants to house to house to house to house in a succession, you would gradually be weaning them of the heat that they started out with and get them ready to be transplanted out into the harsh wilds of the real world. I mentioned satin when I explained the breeches ball. What I forgot to say was that um, there's satin nowadays, from my experience, is usually less expensive than, say, silk. However, satin at this time was still a quite expensive fabric. So if you had satin curtains, uh, that was really quite an investment. Or satin upholstery, that would be definitely showing off that you had the ability to purchase something that was, was upholstered or enough fabric to make curtains out of uh, the satin. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, a scullery, You've heard scullery made over and over and over again in the books that we've read. Uh, scullery, just a reminder, is the small room where dishes were washed next to the kitchen. When you hear Catherine refer to Fullerton, that is the Allens' home that she's talking about. So just so you don't get confused. Patterned. You're going to hear a reference to a patterned maid. We've heard patterns referred to before. These are attachments that you could put on the bottom of your shoes that would basically they're like mini stilts to keep your your real shoes off the floor and keep them dry so if you were going to mop the floor or be in a scullery where water might be slopping around being on patterns would make sense they were little wooden flat platforms that had little iron stilts underneath that were just a few inches long and then straps that would keep this on your foot. And that way you're basically balancing yourself on, it looks a little bit in the picture, like you're balancing on a slightly wider than average ice skating blade, but it's, it's not, it is a rounded iron bit that you're walking on. Either way, it had to be kind of weird to be on those because your entire foot, the entire length of your foot is not touching the ground. Obviously, if your entire foot was covered by that iron thing, you would walk like you walk in ice skates and it would be kind of hard, but you would have to balance on this little iron plate that is right in the middle of your foot. So heel and toe can rock back and forth, but middle of foot would be supported. Montoni, just to remind you, Montoni was the name of the main villain in the book, The Mysteries of Udolfo. And he is not a nice man. He's the villain. And therefore, definitionally, not a nice man. 
He treats his wife, who is the heroine's aunt in the book, very cruelly. And he locks her in a room or locks her away in you know her part of the house. And she dies from harsh treatment. Harsh treatment is the term to remember as you're listening to chapter 23. And that be that. All right, let's listen to chapters 22 and 23 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the lovely Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 22. The housemaid's folding back her window shutters at eight o'clock the next day was the sound which first roused Catherine, and she opened her eyes, wondering that they could ever have been closed on objects of cheerfulness. Her fire was already burning, and a bright morning had succeeded the tempest of the night. Instantaneously, with the consciousness of existence, returned her recollection of the manuscript, and springing from the bed in the very moment of the maid's going away, she eagerly collected every scattered sheet which had burst from the roll on its falling to the ground, and flew back to enjoy the luxury of their perusal on her pillow. She now plainly saw that she must not expect a manuscript of equal length with the generality of what she had shuddered over in books, for the roll, seeming to consist entirely of small disjointed sheets, was altogether but of a trifling size, and much less than she had supposed it to be at first. A greedy eye glanced rapidly over a page. She stared at its import. Could it be possible, or did her senses play her false? An inventory of linen, in coarse and modern characters, seemed all that was before her. If the evidence of sight might be trusted, she held a washing-bill in her hand. She seized another sheet and saw the same articles with little variation. A third, a fourth, a fifth presented nothing new. Shirts, stockings, cravats and waistcoats faced her in each. Two others, penned by the same hand, marked an expenditure scarcely more interesting in letters, hair powders, shoestrings and breeches ball, and the larger sheet, which had enclosed the rest, seemed by its first cramped line to Pultis Chestnut Mare a farrier's bill. Such was the collection of papers, left, perhaps as she could then suppose, by the negligence of a servant in the place whence she had taken them, which had filled her with expectation and alarm, and robbed her of half her night's rest. She felt humble to the dust. Could not the adventure of the chest have taught her wisdom? A corner of its catching her eye as she lay seemed to rise up in judgment against her. Nothing could now be clearer than the absurdity of her recent fancies. To suppose that a manuscript of many generations back could have remained undiscovered in a room such as that, so modern, so habitable, or that she could be the first to possess the skill of unlocking a cabinet, the key of which was open to all. How could she have so imposed on herself? Heaven forbid that Henry Tilney should ever know her folly, and it was in great measure his own doing, for had not the cabinet appeared so exactly to agree with his description of her adventures, she should never have felt the smallest curiosity about it. This was the only comfort that occurred. Impatient to get rid of those hateful evidences of her folly, those detestable papers then scattered over the bed, she rose directly, and folding them up as neatly as possible in the same shape as before, returned them to the same spot within the cabinet, with a very hearty wish that no untoward accident might ever bring them forward again, to disgrace her even with herself. Why the locks should have been so difficult to open, however, was still something remarkable, for she could now manage them with perfect ease. In this there was surely something mysterious, and she indulged in the flattering suggestion for half a minute, till the possibility of the doors having been at first unlocked, and of being herself its fastener, darted into her head, and cost her another blush. She got away as soon as she could from a room in which her conduct produced such unpleasant reflections, and found her way with all speed to the breakfast parlour, as it had been pointed out to her by Miss Tilney the evening before. Henry was alone in it, and his immediate hope of her having been undisturbed by the tempest, with such an art reference to the character of the building they inhabited, was rather distressing. For the world she would not have her weakness suspected. And yet, unequal to absolute falsehood, was constrained to acknowledge that the wind had kept her awake a little. "'But we have a charming morning after it,' she added, desiring to get rid of the subject. "'And storms and sleeplessness are nothing when they are over.' What beautiful hyacinths! I have just learnt to love a hyacinth. 
And how might you learn, by accident or argument? Your sister taught me. I cannot tell how. Mrs. Allen used to take pains year after year to make me like them, but I never could, till I saw them the other day in Milsom Street. I am naturally indifferent about flowers. But now you love a hyacinth. So much the better. You have gained a new source of enjoyment, and it's well to have as many holds upon happiness as possible. Besides, a taste for flowers is always desirable in your sex, as a means of getting you out of doors, and tempting you to a more frequent exercise than you would otherwise take. And though the love of a hyacinth may be rather domestic, who can tell? The sentiment once raised, but you may in time come to love a rose. But I do not want any such pursuit to get me out of doors. The pleasure of walking and breathing fresh air is enough for me, and in fine weather I'm out more than half my time. Mamma says I'm never within. At any rate, however, I'm pleased that you've learnt to love a hyacinth. The mere habit of learning to love is the thing. And teachableness of disposition in a young lady is a great blessing. Has my sister a pleasant mode of instruction? Catherine was saved the embarrassment of attempting an answer by the entrance of the general, whose smiling compliments announced a happy state of mind, but whose gentle hint of sympathetic early rising did not advance her composure. The elegance of the breakfast set forced itself upon Catherine's notice when they were seated at table, and luckily it had been the general's choice. He was enchanted by her approbation of his taste, confessed it to be neat and simple, thought it right to encourage the manufacturer of his country, and for his part, to his uncritical palate, the tea was as well flavoured from the clay of Staffordshire as from that of Dresden or Sevres. But this was quite an old set, purchased two years ago. The manufacture was much improved since that time. He had seen some beautiful specimens when last in town, and, had he not been perfectly without vanity of that kind, might have been tempted to order a new set. He trusted, however, that an opportunity might ere long occur of selecting one, though not for himself. Catherine was probably the only one of the party who did not understand him. Shortly after breakfast, Henry left them for Woodstone, where business required and would keep him two or three days. They all attended in the hall to see him mount his horse, and immediately on re-entering the breakfast room, Catherine walked to a window in the hope of catching another glimpse of his figure. "'This is a somewhat heavy call upon your brother's fortitude,' observed the general to Eleanor. "'Woodstone will make but a sombre appearance to-day.' "'Is it a pretty place?' asked Catherine. "'What say you, Eleanor? Speak your opinion. "'For ladies can best tell the taste of ladies in regard to places as well as men. "'I think it will be acknowledged by the most impartial eye to have many recommendations. "'The house stands among fine meadows facing south-east, "'with an excellent kitchen garden in the same aspect. "'The wall surrounding which I built and stocked myself about ten years ago for the benefit of my son.' "'It's a family living, Miss Morland, and the property in the place being chiefly my own, "'you may believe I take care that it shall not be a bad one. "'Did Henry's income depend solely on this living, he would not be ill-provided for. "'Perhaps it may be seem odd that with only two younger children I should think any profession necessary for him, "'and certainly there are moments when we could all wish for him to disengage from every tie of business. "'But though I may not exactly make converts of you young ladies,' I am sure your father, Miss Morland, would agree with me in thinking it expedient to give every young man some employment. The money is nothing, it's not an object, but employment is the thing. Even Frederick, my eldest son, you see, who will perhaps inherit as considerable landed property as any private man in the country, has his profession. The imposing effect of this last argument was equal to his wishes. The silence of the lady proved it to be unanswerable. Something had been said the evening before of her being shown over the house, and he now offered himself as her conductor, and though Catherine had hoped to explore it accompanied only by his daughter, it was a proposal of too much happiness in itself, under any circumstances not to be gladly accepted, for she had already been eighteen hours in the abbey, and had seen only a few of its rooms. The netting box, just leisurely drawn forth, was closed with joyful haste, and she was ready to attend him in a moment and when they had gone over the house, he promised himself moreover the pleasure of accompanying her into the shrubberies and garden. She curtsied her acquiescence. But perhaps it might be more agreeable to her to make those her first object. The weather was at present favourable, and at this time of year the uncertainty was very great of its continuing so. Which would she prefer? He was equally at her service, which did his daughter think would most accord with her fair friend's wishes. But he thought he could discern, yes, he certainly read in Miss Morland's eyes a judicious desire of making use of the present smiling weather. 
but when did she judge remiss? The abbey would always be safe and dry. He yielded implicitly and would fetch his hat and attend them in a moment. He left the room, and Catherine, with a disappointed, anxious face, began to speak of her unwillingness that he should be taking them out of doors against his own inclination, under a mistaken idea of pleasing her. But she was stopped by Miss Tilney's saying, with a little confusion, "'I believe it will be wisest to take the morning while it is so fine, and do not be uneasy on my father's account. He always walks out at this time of day.' Catherine did not exactly know how this was to be understood. Why was Miss Tilney embarrassed? Could there be any unwillingness in the general's side to show her over the abbey? The proposal was his own. And was it not odd that he should always take his walk so early? Neither her father nor Mr. Allen did so. It was certainly very provoking. She was all impatience to see the house, and had scarcely any curiosity about the grounds. If Henry had been with them indeed, but now she should not know what was picturesque when she saw it. Such were her thoughts, but she kept them to herself, and put on her bonnet in patient discontent. She was struck, however, beyond her expectation by the grandeur of the abbey as she saw it for the first time from the lawn. The whole building enclosed a large court, and two sides of the quadrangle, rich in Gothic ornaments, stood forward for admiration. The remainder was shut off by the knolls of old trees or luxuriant plantations, and the steep woody hills rising behind to give it shelter were beautiful even in the leafless month of March. Catherine had seen nothing to compare with it, and her feelings of delight were so strong that without waiting for any better authority she boldly burst forth in wonder and praise. The general listened with assenting gratitude, and it seemed as if his own estimation of Northanger had waited unfixed till that hour. The kitchen garden was to be next admired, and he led the way to it across a small portion of the park. The number of acres contained in this garden was such as Catherine could not listen to without dismay, being more than double the extent of all Mr. Allen's, as well as her father's, including churchyard and orchard. The walls seemed countless in number, endless in length. A village of hothouses seemed to arise among them, and a whole parish to be at work within the enclosure. The general was flattered by her looks of surprise, which told him almost as plainly as he soon forced her to tell him with words that she had never seen any gardens at all equal to them before. And he then modestly owned that, without any ambition of the sort himself, without any solicitude about it, he did believe them to be unrivalled in the kingdom. If he had a hobby horse, it was that. He loved a garden. Though careless enough in most matters of eating, he loved good fruit, or if he did not, his friends and children did. There were great vexations, however, attending such a garden as his. The utmost care could not always secure the most valuable fruits. The pinery had yielded only one hundred in the last year. Mr. Allen, he supposed, must feel these inconveniences as well as himself. No, not at all. Mr. Allen did not care about the garden and never went into it. With a triumphant smile of self-satisfaction, the general wished he could do the same, for he never entered his without being vexed in one way or another by its falling short of his plan. How were Mr. Allen's succession houses worked? Describing the nature of his own as they entered them. Mr. Allen had only one small hot house, which Mrs. Allen had the use of for her plants in winter, and there was a fire in it now and then. He is a happy man, said the general, with a look of very happy contempt. Having taken her into every division, and led her under every wall till she was heartily weary of seeing and wondering, he suffered the girls to at last seize the advantage of an outer door, and then, expressing his wish to examine the effect of some recent alterations about the tea-house, proposed it as no unpleasant extension of their walk, if Miss Morland were not tired. "'But where are you going, Eleanor? Why do you choose that cold, damp path to it? Miss Morland will get wet. Our best way is across the park.' "'This is so favourite a walk of mine,' said Miss Tilney, "'that I always think it the best and nearest way, but perhaps it may be damp.' It was a narrow, winding path, through a thick grove of old Scotch firs, and Catherine, struck by its gloomy aspect, and eager to enter it, could not, even by the general's disapprobation, be kept from stepping forward. He perceived her inclination, and having again urged the plea of health in vain, was too polite to make further opposition.' He excused himself, however, from attending them. The rays of the sun were not too cheerful for him, and he would meet them by another course. He turned away, and Catherine was shocked to find how much her spirits were relieved by the separation. 
The shock, however, being less real than the relief, offered it no injury, and she began to talk with easy gaiety of the delightful melancholy which such a grove inspired. I am particularly fond of this spot, said her companion with a sigh. It was my mother's favourite walk. Catherine had never heard Mrs Tilney mentioned in the family before, and the interest excited by this tender remembrance showed itself directly in her altered countenance and in the attentive pause with which she waited for something more. "'I used to walk here so often with her,' added Eleanor, "'though I never loved it then as I have loved it since, and that time, indeed, I used to wonder at her choice, but her memory endears it now.' And ought it not, reflected Catherine, to endear it to her husband, yet the general would not enter it. Miss Tilney continuing silent, she ventured to say, her death must have been a great affliction. A great and increasing one, replied the other in a low voice. I was only thirteen when it happened, and though I felt my loss perhaps as strongly as one so young could feel it, I did not, I could not then know what a loss it was. She stopped for a moment, and then added with great firmness, "'I have no sister, you know. And though Henry, though my brothers are very affectionate, and Henry is a great deal here, which I am most thankful for, it is impossible for me not to be often solitary. To be sure, you must miss him very much. A mother would always have been present. A mother would have been a constant friend. Her influence would have been beyond all other. Was she a very charming woman?' Was she handsome? Was there a picture of her in the abbey? And why has she been so partial to that grove? Was it from dejection of spirits? When questions now eagerly poured forth. The first three received a ready affirmation, the two others were passed by, and Catherine's interest in the deceased Mrs Tilney augmented with every question, whether answered or not. Of her unhappiness in marriage she felt persuaded, the general certainly had been an unkind husband. He did not love her walk. Could he, therefore, have loved her? And besides, handsome as he was, there was something in the turn of his features which spoke his not having behaved very well to her. Her picture, I suppose, blushing at the consummate art of her own question, hangs in your father's room. No, it was intended for the drawing-room, but my father was dissatisfied with the painting, and for some time it had no place. Soon after her death I obtained it for my own, and hung it in my bedchamber, where I should be happy to show it to you. It is very like. Here was another proof, a portrait, very like, of a departed wife, not valued by her husband. He must have been dreadfully cruel to her. Catherine attempted no longer to hide from herself the nature of the feelings which, in spite of all his attentions he had previously excited, and what had been terror and dislike before, was now absolute aversion. Yes, aversion! His cruelty to such a charming woman made him odious to her. She had often read of such characters, characters which Mr. Allen had been used to call unnatural and overdrawn, but here was proof positive to the contrary. She had just settled this point when the end of the path brought them directly upon the general, and in spite of all her virtuous indignation, she found herself again obliged to walk with him, listen to him, and even to smile when he smiled. Being no longer able, however, to receive pleasure from the surrounding objects, she soon began to walk with lassitude. The general perceived it, and with a concern for her health, which seemed to reproach her for her opinion of him, was most urgent for returning with his daughter to the house. He would follow them in a quarter of an hour. Again they parted, but Eleanor was called back in half a minute to receive a strict charge against taking her friend around the abbey till his return. This second instance of his anxiety to delay what she so much wished for struck Catherine as very remarkable. Chapter 23 An hour passed away before the general came in, spent on the part of his young guest in no very favourable consideration of his character. This lengthened absence, these solitary rambles did not speak a mind at ease, or a conscience void of reproach. At length he appeared, and whatever might have been the gloom of his meditations, he could still smile with them. Miss Tilney, understanding in part her friend's curiosity to see the house, soon revived the subject, and her father, being contrary to Catherine's expectations, unprovided with any pretence for further delay, beyond that of stopping five minutes to order refreshments to be in the room by their return, was at last ready to escort them. 
they set forward, and with a grandeur of air, a dignified step which caught the eye, but could not shake the doubts of the well-read Catherine, he led the way across the hall, through the common drawing-room and one useless antechamber, into a room magnificent both in size and furniture, the real drawing-room, used only with company of consequence. It was very noble, very grand, very charming, was all that Catherine had to say, for her indiscriminating eye scarcely discerned the colour of the satin, and all minuteness of praise, all praise that had such meaning, was supplied by the general. The costliness or elegance of any room's fitting up could be nothing to her, for she cared for no furniture for more modern date than the fifteenth century. When the general had satisfied his own curiosity in a close examination of every well-known ornament, they proceeded to the library, an apartment in its way of equal magnificence, exhibiting a collection of books on which a humble man might have looked with pride. Catherine heard, admired, and wondered with more genuine feeling than before, gathered all that she could from this storehouse of knowledge by running over the titles of half a shelf, and was ready to proceed but suites of apartments did not spring up with her wishes. Large as was the building, she had already visited the greatest part, though, on being told that, with the addition of the kitchen, the six or seven rooms she had now seen surrounded three sides of the court. She could scarcely believe it, or overcome the suspicion of there being many chambers secreted. It was some relief, however, that they were to return to the rooms in common use by passing through a few of less importance, looking into the court, which with occasional passages, not wholly unintricate, connected the different sides. And she was further soothed in her progress by being told that she was treading what had once been a cloister, having traces of cells pointed out, observing several doors that were neither open nor explained to her by finding herself successively in a billiard-room and in the general's private apartment without comprehending their connection, or being able to turn aright when she left them, and lastly by passing through a dark little room owning Henry's authority and strewn with his litter of books, guns and greatcoats. From the dining-room, of which, though already seen and always to be seen at five o'clock, the general could not forego the pleasure of pacing out the length, as to what she neither doubted nor cared for, they proceeded by quick communication to the kitchen, the ancient kitchen of the convent, rich in the massy walls and smoke of former days, and in the stoves and hot closets of the present. The general's improving hand had not loitered here. Every modern invention to facilitate the labour of the cooks had been adopted within this their spacious theatre, and when the genius of others had failed, his own had often produced the perfection wanted. His endowments of this spot alone might at any time have placed him high among the benefactors of the convent. With the walls of the kitchen ended all the antiquity of the abbey, the fourth side of the quadrangle having, on account of its decaying state, been removed by the general's father, and the present erected in its place. All that was venerable ceased here. The new building was not only new, but declared itself to be so, intended only for offices, and enclosed behind the stable yards. No uniformative architecture had been thought necessary. Catherine could have raved at the hand which had swept away what must have been beyond the value of all the rest, for the purpose of more domestic economy, and would willingly have been spared the mortification of a walk through scenes so fallen, had the general allowed it. But if he had a vanity, it was in the arrangement of his offices, and as he was convinced that, to a mind like Miss Morland's, a view of the accommodation and comforts by which the labourers of her inferiors were softened, it must always be gratifying. He should make no apology for leading her on. They took a slight survey of all, and Catherine was impressed beyond her expectation by their multiplicity and their convenience. The purposes for which a few shapeless pantries and a comfortless scullery were deemed sufficient at Fullerton were here carried on in an appropriate divisions, commodious and roomy. The number of servants continually appearing did not strike her less than the number of their offices. Wherever they went, some patterned girls stopped to curtsy, or some footman in dishabille sneaked off. Yet this was an abbey. How inexpressibly different in these domestic arrangements from such as she had read about! from abbeys and castles in which, though certainly larger than Northanger, all the dirty work of the house was to be done by two pair female hands at the utmost. How could they get through it all? Had often amazed Mrs. Allen, and when Catherine saw what was necessary here she began to be amazed herself. 
they returned to the hall that the chief staircase might be ascended and the beauty of its wood and ornaments of rich carving might be pointed out. Having gained the top, they turned in an opposite direction from the gallery in which her room lay and shortly entered one on the same plan but superior in length and breadth. She was here shown successively into three large bedchambers with their dressing rooms most completely and handsomely fitted up. Everything that money and taste could do to give comfort and elegance to apartments had been bestowed on these, and being furnished within the last five years, they were perfect in all that would be generally pleasing and wanting in all that could give pleasure to Catherine. As they were surveying the last, the general, after slightly naming a few of the distinguished characters by whom they had been at times been honoured, turned with a smiling countenance to Catherine, and ventured to hope that henceforward some of the earliest tenants might be our friends from Fullerton. She felt the unexpected compliment, and deeply regretted the impossibility of thinking well of a man so kindly disposed towards herself, and so full of civility to all her family. The gallery was terminated by folding doors, which Miss Tilney advancing had thrown open, and passed through and seemed to on the point of doing the same by the first door to the left, in another long reach of gallery, when the general, coming forward, called her hastily, and as Catherine thought rather angrily back, demanding whither she was going. And what was there more to be seen, had not Miss Morland already seen all that could be worth her notice? and did she not suppose her friend might be glad of some refreshment after so much exercise? Miss Tilney drew back directly, and the heavy doors were closed upon the mortified Catherine, who, having seen in a momentary glance beyond them a narrower passage, more numerous openings and symptoms of a winding staircase, believed herself at last within the reach of something worth her notice and felt, as she unwillingly paced back the gallery, that she would rather be allowed to examine that end of the house than see all the finery of all the rest. The general's evident desire of preventing such an examination was an additional stimulant. Something was certainly to be concealed. Her fancy, though it had trespassed lately once or twice, could not mislead her here. And what that something was... A short sentence of Miss Tilney's as they followed the general at some distance downstairs seemed to point out, I was going to take you into what was my mother's room, the room in which she died, were all her words, but few as they were, they conveyed pages of intelligence to Catherine. It was no wonder the general should shrink from the sight of such objects, as that room must contain, a room in all probability, never entered by him since the dreadful scene had passed, which released his suffering wife and left him to the stings of conscience. She ventured, when next alone with Eleanor, to express her wish of being permitted to see it, as well as all the rest of that side of the house, and Eleanor promised to attend her there, whenever they should have a convenient hour. Catherine understood her, the general must be watched from home before the room could be entered. "'It remains as it was, I suppose,' said she in a tone of feeling. "'Yes, entirely. And how long ago may it be that your mother died? She has been dead these nine years, and nine years Catherine knew was a trifle of time, compared with what generally elapsed after the death of an injured wife, before her room was put to rights. "'You were with her, I suppose, to the last?' No, said Miss Tilney, sighing. I was unfortunately from home. Her illness was sudden and short, and before I arrived it was all over. Catherine's blood ran cold with the horrid suggestions which naturally sprang from these words. Could it be possible? Could Henry's father? Yet how many were the examples to justify even the blackest suspicions? And when she saw him in the evening, while she worked with her friend, slowly pacing the drawing-room for an hour together, in silent thoughtfulness, with downcast eyes and contracted brow, she felt secure from all possibility of wronging him. It was the air and attitude of a Montoni. What could more plainly speak the gloomy workings of a mind, not wholly dead to every sense of humanity, in its fearful review of past scenes of guilt? unhappy man, and the anxiousness of her spirits directed her eyes towards his figure so repeatedly as to catch Miss Tilney's notice. My father, she whispered, often walks about the room in this way. It is nothing unusual. So much the worse, thought Catherine. Such ill-timed exercise was of a piece with the strange unreasonableness of his morning walks, and boded nothing good. After an evening, 
the little variety and seeming length of which made her peculiarly sensible of Henry's importance among them, she was heartily glad to be dismissed, though it was a look from the general not designed for her observation which sent his daughter to the bell. When the butler would have lit his master's candle, however, he was forbidden. The latter was not going to retire. "'I have many pamphlets to finish,' he said to Catherine, "'before I can close my eyes, "'and perhaps may be poring over the affairs of the nation "'for hours after you're asleep. "'Can either of us be more meetly employed? "'My eyes will be blinding for the good of others, "'and yours preparing by rest for future mischief.' "'But neither the business alleged "'nor the magnificent compliment "'could win Catherine from thinking "'that some very different object "'must occasion so serious a delay of proper repose.' To be kept up for hours after the family were in bed by stupid pamphlets was not very likely. There must be some deeper cause. Something was to be done which could be done only when the household slept, and the probability that Mrs. Tilney yet lived, shut up for causes unknown, and receiving from the pitiless hands of her husband a nightly supply of coarse food was the conclusion which necessarily followed. Shocking as was the idea, it was at least better than a death unfairly hastened, as in the natural course of things she must ere long be released. The suddenness of her reputed illness, the absence of her daughter, and probably of her other children at the time, all favoured the supposition of her imprisonment. Its origin, jealousy perhaps, or wanton cruelty, was yet to be unravelled. In resolving these matters while she undressed, it suddenly struck her as not unlikely that she might that morning have passed near the very spot of this unfortunate woman's confinement, might have been within a few paces of the cell in which she languished out her days, for what part of the abbey could be more fitted for the purpose than that which yet bore traces of monastic division? In the high-arched passage, paved with stone which already she had trodden with particular awe, she well remembered the doors of which the general had given no account. To what might not these doors lead? In support of the plausibility of this conjecture, it further occurred to her that the forbidden gallery in which lay the apartments of the unfortunate Mrs. Tilney must be, as certainly as his memory could guide her, exactly the suspected range of cells, and the staircase by the side of those apartments, of which she had caught a transient glimpse communicating by some secret means within those cells, might well have favoured the barbarous proceedings of her husband. Down that staircase she had perhaps been conveyed in a state of well-prepared insensibility. Catherine sometimes started at the boldness of her own surmises, and sometimes hoped or feared that she had gone too far, but they were supported by such appearances as made their dismissal impossible. The side of the quadrangle, which she supposed the guilty scene to be acting, being, according to her belief, just opposite her own, it struck her that if judiciously watched, some rays of light from the general's lamp might glimmer through the lower windows as he passed to the prison of his wife, and twice before she stepped into bed she stole gently from her room to the corresponding window in the gallery to see if it appeared. But all abroad was dark, and it must yet be too early. The various ascending noises convinced her that the servants must still be up. Till midnight, she supposed, it would be in vain to watch. But then, when the clock had struck twelve, and all was quiet, she would, if not appalled by darkness, steal out and look once more. The clock struck twelve, and Catherine had been half an hour asleep. And Catherine, once again, falls asleep. A perfectly non-Gothic ending to the chapter. Oh, Catherine. <sighs> so the final sentence of this chapter is actually a mirror of a chapter, a chapter's end in The Mysteries of Udolpho, where the heroine first arrives at Castle Udolpho. And the the actual end of the Udolpho chapter re reads, The castle clock struck one before she closed her eyes to sleep. You know, because she wasn't able to get to sleep at a normal time. The, the mysteries of the castle had kept her awake. And here, Catherine's already been asleep half an hour. By the time it gets to 12, she doesn't even make it to one. Some gothic heroine she is. Before we go back to the beginning of the chapters to pick up the things that we didn't talk about before, 
I do want to make a point about General Tilney here at the end of chapter 23. When everybody left the room where they're spending their evening, the lighting of the candles to go up to bed, uh, you've probably seen done in movies. I know they actually make quite a deal of it in um, Little Women, the, the one from the 90s with Winona Ryder, which I still think is very good, and where they do wear bonnets. Everybody else is getting their candles lit. The, the butler was going to light a candle for General Tilney. And then General Tilney says, oh, no, no, no. I will sit here alone in the dark reading pamphlets for my country. You know, for queen and country, I am going to stay up late and do important, capital I, work, capital W. It is, he is reminding me of several Jewish mother jokes I remember, one of which is, how many Jewish mothers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Oh, none. No, no, it's fine. I'll just sit here in the dark. It's fine. Which, honestly, I think I've said before. <laughs> so, oh, the joke sometimes hits a little too close to home. But Tilney's got an interesting tude. The attitude on this guy, well... We can now go back to the beginning and pick up on some of the characterization that Jane Austen gives us on old General Tilney, this being one of those lovely, I'll let my eyes go blind in service to you. You, sweet child, go rest your head so that you can be pretty tomorrow. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. But back to the beginning of chapter 22. The fact that Jane Austen made the mysterious writing that Catherine comes across, this rolled up, you know, wad of paper, the fact that she turned them into receipts from a laundry, the, all the laundry bills, that is hilarious. Because number one, it was probably written by a servant. Number two, it was the only person who would have seen this would have been uh, the servant, maybe the head housekeeper who paid out or things like this. And number three, how boring, just spectacular on Jane Austen's part. I loved that. I also loved Henry in the morning. The way he is with Catherine, I am sure, could come across very patronizing. But I keep seeing Henry as one of those people who's able to enjoy learning things he already knows, but learning them because he's seeing someone else learn them. So it's like, it's like when you have kids and they figure out something that you as an adult person have known for many years now. And yet when you watch them get it, it's really awesome. And it makes you so happy and it makes you love them all that much more. And that's not a patronizing thing. It's a joy thing. It, it, I'm sure it could be a patronizing thing. But it is also a joy thing. And Henry seems to get a lot of joy out of watching Catherine learning about this larger world that she really hadn't been part of. And so when she's talking about, you know, I just learned how to love a hyacinth. Well, you know, perhaps next you could learn to love a rose, which is both kind of a sweet, funny statement. But it is also true that Catherine is becoming comfortable in a indoor kind of way. She is starting to leave the indoor world that she had been living in and go out into the larger world. Hyacinths are indoor plants. Roses are outdoor plants. And so it's really pointing out in a literary way that Catherine is making this move into becoming a grown-up human person and that it's, it's really lovely to see. Henry also seems to make light of issues that befall befell surrounded women. Some of the etiquette books and the how to teach girls to have manners, darn it, books, some of them talked about teachableness in respect to women, that a young woman who was teachable meant that she was sweet and shy and retiring and did what she was told. <laughs> so Henry is making fun of that when he says, the mere habit of learning to love is the thing, and a teachableness of disposition in a young lady is a great blessing. And then goes on to say, and there's a, an M dash there, has my sister a pleasant mode of instruction? Because he is very well aware 
that his sister is highly intelligent and knows her way around things and doesn't need to be teachable to be marvelous. But Catherine is in a teachable state. She is kind of shy and docile and does what she's told, often very literally. And Eleanor is going to be a a great friend for her to have to learn how to be a good grown-up person. However, that is stopped by the entrance of General Tilney. And if you didn't understand the phrasing here, it is A, not your fault, and B, one of the things that I didn't want to bring up until you'd heard the whole set of chapters. Here he comes in and stops the conversation by entering the room, which was good for Catherine because she was embarrassed and didn't know how to answer Henry at that point. The general comes in smiling, announced to be in a happy state of mind, and then gives a gentle hint of sympathetic early rising. What that is saying is he gives Catherine a hint that if she were to wake up and get up a little bit earlier, like everybody else in the house, they would be able to eat breakfast together. Now, we'd already seen this kind of thing happen on the day that they left Bath. Here we're getting it again. He's really attached to the table, (laughs) the dining together, to timing. He's certainly punctual. This could all just be military stuff, that he's, he's been trained this way, and that, therefore, this is the correct way for people to behave. Certainly possible. When you put this together with the way he talks to Eleanor and the way he does the, the tours of the, the house and the garden and the way he is at the end, the no, no, I'll just sit here in the dark, you're starting to get a picture of not the smiling, genial, super friendly, helpful guy quite so much. And if that's the impression you were starting to get, then you would be correct. I'm sure many longtime listeners have picked up on the fact that this is an interesting wealthy family in other ways, too. One of them is General Tilney is general. He's a landowner of vast property, but he is he's a general, a private man, and which are usually extremely wealthy men. Um, that's a, a man, a private man at that level is somebody who is not holding public office. Or, uh, you know, they're not in the House of Lords. They're, they're not doing anything necessarily for the, the greater good of the, the country or, or their family or anything. They, they don't have a job. General Tilney, for whatever reason, went into the military as a wealthy land-owning family's son. He may, may or may not have been the first son, but he did inherit the land, which makes you think that he was probably the eldest. His eldest... Frederick also has gone into the military. I am starting to think it's probably because that was not an option, (laughs) even though he was the eldest son and technically didn't need to have a job or a profession. I don't think General Tilney was going to give him a whole lot of options. General Tilney then goes on to make it clear that he has enough money and property that even though Henry is the second son, he has enough money that Henry didn't need to go get a job as a clergyman, but that he thinks having a profession, something to do, is very good for young men. And so Henry has this position. We also know he's hired a curate to do some of the work for him as well, which is probably also his father's decision. Because of the closeness of Henry's parish, his father is also the main person who would be paying for that parish's upkeep. So he is, in fact, employing his son as as the vicar for that, that parish. More on General Tilney. You've noticed by now, I think we brought it up last last episode or the episode before, that General Tilney has a habit of saying, what say you, Eleanor? And then he goes on to answer his own question, which he does at length in today's chapters. I don't know if you heard it go by, it goes by very quickly, that at one point in chapter 22, when they're touring the garden, he says his pet passion is for fruit cultivation. And yet by the end of chapter 23, he is telling us that his pet passion is furnishing his servants' offices. So I am starting to see a 
parallel here that I didn't expect to see. And we don't know if it will hold up yet or not. But I am positing that in many ways, General Tilney and Isabella are mirrors of each other in a certain level of frivolity and insincerity. And I don't mean frivolity like joyful frivolity, like, oh, this is so fun. I mean, paying attention to frivolous things and making a big deal out of things that really don't matter quite so much. And really, seriously, who cares what your pet passion is? All you're doing is bragging, which is the Isabella side of things, to my mind. I don't know if that's going to hold up or not, because I just thought of it. But Tilney's starting to irk me a lot. And part of that irkness that I'm feeling is because of Eleanor. I love her. I think she's she's very straightforward and simple. And I don't mean simple like not particularly bright. I mean simple like a simple ebony vase or a simple stool, mission style or shaker style stool, where the, the simplicity is really a, a clarity of design and beautiful example of, of form following function. That there's a a simplicity in some kinds of art that is really, really hard to create. But that when you see it, it's just kind of breathtaking in its unassuming beauty. And that's the vision that I have of Eleanor. She's quiet, but she's not particularly shy. She's kind, but she's not sweet. She's smart, but she doesn't have to make a show of it. And some of these things we learn about her because we've met Henry first, and we got to know how smart and clever he is, and also how funny he is. And the fact that the two of them love each other so much and get along so well is an indication that she can keep up with him. He is not paternal to, towards her. And he has, in fact, said things to the effect of girl, girl smart. So there's that. At the end of chapter 23, well, we, we saw it earlier when Tilney came in and asked Eleanor a question and then promptly continued to give his own opinion on the matter. Now we have Eleanor about to take Catherine in to see her mother's room. And Tilney catches them. And this is all narrative instead of quoted dialogue. And I think Austin is doing that here for a very specific reason. So I'm going to read a little chunk of this for you. They were getting to the first door on the left in another long reach of gallery. When the general coming forwards called her hastily, and as Catherine thought, rather angrily, back, demanding whither she was going, and what was there more to be seen? Had not Miss Moreland already seen all that could be worth her notice? And did she not suppose her friend might be glad of some refreshment after so much exercise? And the next sentence is, Miss Tilney drew back directly. She doesn't pause to think or speak or anything. It's Miss Tilney drew back directly, comma, and the heavy doors were closed upon the mortified Catherine, comma, who having seen in a momentary glance beyond them, comma, a narrow passage, comma, more numerous openings, comma, and symptoms of a winding staircase, comma, believed herself at last within the reach of something worth her notice, and felt as she unwillingly paced back the gallery that she would rather be allowed to examine the end of the house than see all the finery of all the rest. This is why I think Jane Austen did this as narrative. Catherine has yet to pick up, for real, on General Tilney's relationship with his kids. She hasn't really noticed how Eleanor is responding to General Tilney. And just like Fosco in The Woman in White, when he's always got his little birds and they're so cute and they're so sweet and that's marvelous until you notice that his wife, who we've already heard about before as having been very headstrong in her youth and kind of a troublemaker, and we have only ever seen her as this incredibly meek, pretty much silent woman, that we start to get the hint that Fosco might be very sweet to his birds, but probably not so much to his wife, and that we, she is ex exhibiting learned behavior. Here we have Eleanor 
immediately upon hearing Tilney's voice, closing the door, <laughs> turning around, leaving. Okay, done. We're, we're finished. Thanks, Dad. Catherine's not picking up on any of that. Catherine is noticing the architecture and the mysterious nature of an unexamined hallway. Catherine is going to continue not to notice important things about people. She's only seeing reflections, dim reflections, of these books she's read in her surroundings. And she's got these expectations built into her that in these surroundings, certain things must happen. You must have someone who died from harsh treatment. They couldn't have died from typhus. They had to die from harsh treatment. You can't have a, a wing of a house that is closed off because it's expensive to heat and the family is not big enough to need to use that wing. It has to have been closed off for a reason. And that reason must be dark and mysterious. We're going to see her continue to miss important information, just as she did with Isabella. And yeah, she's just going to continue to miss some stuff. All righty. I have some voicemails to play for you. I'm going to let the voicemails play you out. First one is from Sarah Blake, and Sarah has some information on dancing that is similar to the dancing done in the books, but currently done. Jana Lee has some really, really good insights on the father's advice that he gives to his daughters. And Jana Lee, I love your read on the advice. Yes, thank you. And then we have two voicemails from Tara. I have given you a link in the show notes for the video that Tara mentions in the first one you listened to. And in the second, Tara, I totally forgot about that in Practical Magic. But yeah, that would be how they did it. You're right. It's a practical effect. And that makes sense now. Ha! I love stuff like that. All right, here we go with the voicemails. Have a great week. Take care of yourselves and each other. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. This is Sarah Blake. Um, I have been really enjoying listening to Northanger Abbey. I read the book uh, 10 years ago or so, and I, yeah, I'm just, I'm loving it. Um, and I'm really enjoying all of the conversation around the dancing. Um, and it has put me in mind of contra dancing. Uh, before, before the panorama, um, I really liked going to contra dances. Um, contra dance in the U.S. Uh, is a an American folk dance. It is uh, usually danced to live fiddle music, and it is very similar to many of these other European set dances. And it it sort of combines elements of all of the not all, but of many different European set dancing traditions. Um, and it, it's lovely. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a ton of different places all throughout the country where you can go, and usually it's free or, like, there's a very small cover charge. Usually they, do like, have skirts available because it's fun to dance in a skirt because there's a lot of twirling. Um, I, I highly recommend it to anybody who is kind of interested in learning more about set dancing and wanting to do some set dancing. Um, there's also, so a lot of the places are very gendered, very like strict gender roles, um, you know, where the, the women are expected to be the followers, the men are expected to be the leaders, et cetera. Um, there's also, um, a handful of really lovely either queer or gender-free contra groups um, that have regular uh, dance nights. Um, and it, I, I, you know, if you are, if you're like me and gender is weird, I uh, highly recommend uh, looking those up. Um, the one here in the Bay Area is called Circle Left. There's also, I know there's one in Chicago, in Chicago. There's a gender-free one in Boston. If you search uh, queer contra dancing, you will find lots of things, um, especially if you include your, you know, nearby metropolitan area. 
Um, yeah, I that's a, that's about it. I highly recommend it. They are really good about um, teaching the steps. There's always a caller, so you don't have to remember. You don't have to memorize anything. Um, and they do a good job of building it up. So they start with a pretty simple dance. Um, there's usually, before the dance starts, there's instructions on the various steps. And uh, and then you just dance. And you dance with whoever you want to. Um, and it, it's a lot of fun. It's so much fun. Anyway, that's all. It makes me happy. I miss it. I'm just going to sit here and think about how much I miss contra dancing and how much I'm looking forward to it starting again. Hi, Heather, this is Janelle, um, Knits and Ikes on Ravelry. I'm a little behind, so I just finished uh, episode 553, which is chapters 14 and 15 from Northanger Abbey, and I was right at the end of um, the book talk, so after we listened to the chapters, and I thought it was really interesting that um, that book of advice that you quoted from a father to his daughters, um, I... I thought it was really interesting because I had a a similar advice-filled conversation with my dad when I started dating. Uh, he was not interested in telling me to hide how smart I was. <laughs> so that's different. But he was very careful to point out that if I went into a dating situation without any expectations, um, that I might end up with a person that I wouldn't be happy with. So he was very um, concerned that as a, a young teenager that I would be dating because somebody was cute or they were funny. And he said that, you know, you always want to have an end goal in mind. Is this a relationship that you want to last your lifetime? Is this because you're friends? Is this, you know, just because he's cute and you want to go out for a couple of times? Keep that clearly in mind when you're dating. And then he talked about um, things that he wanted for me as his daughter. He wanted someone that would cherish me, you know, not just think I was cute, but cherish me. Um, and he wanted, uh, you know, all these things for me because, of course, he's my dad and he wants me to be well, well loved and appreciated. <laughs> and um, I thought it was interesting that I didn't hear, and that might be because uh, you didn't quote the entire book, but I didn't hear the dad telling his daughters not to be educated, um, this, this book from 1770, whatever it was. Um, but I did hear him saying to be cautious about showing their intelligence, which, like, nowadays would be really kind of offensive, but I feel like it's really interesting that his, at least this particular father was that concerned about his daughters and their well-being and maybe I'm reading my dad into this more than I should, but it felt like the concern of the dad in that point wasn't so much that his daughters were intelligent and he he didn't think that was appropriate. It was that he was afraid that his daughters would be punished for being intelligent, and he wanted them to be aware that that was a possibility. And he wanted to tell them to be very careful about who they dated and who they spoke to because not everyone would be able to appreciate their value. So just a thought. Um, I'm really enjoying this book. And I loved in the last step, uh, episode in 552, I think it was, where um, Thorne speaks uh, to Miss Kingley for Catherine, and she's so offended and runs immediately and breaks all of these etiquette rules to apologize and to make things right. I think, like you said, her ability to cut through all of the, well, what if and worries and and social mores, I guess, to make something that she knows is wrong, to make it right immediately, I really admire that. And I love that about this particular heroine. So thank you so much for introducing me to this book. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester. It is 12.49 a.m., and I was listening to chapters 20 and 21 of Northanger Abbey, and you mentioned that Charlotte almost lost her writing desk. Uh, writing desk. Now, uh, you linked out to one, but if someone wants, or if anyone wants to see an actual 
writing desk in use, gussets and godets on YouTube uh, has um, a lockdown vlogdown series she did right before she had her baby in April. And on day nine, she shows her antique writing desk. And it's actually amazing. It's a travel writing desk, and it's no bigger than your OED laid open. And it's really beautiful. It has beautiful blue velvet on it. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. You can tell I am very, very tired. I have lost all adjectives. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just wanted to... Uh, pop on real quick and share that knowledge with you. Um, she opens it up and displays some of the stuff she has inside of it and actually sits at her kitchen table and uses it to write um, Christmas cards, I do believe. But anywho, I'm going to get back to my finger, Abby, and back to the planner craziness I have spread across my entire kitchen table and see how late the night will go for me. I finished listening to the preemptive book talk, and you were asking about tallow candles. Now, I have not made tallow candles, but I do have some candle knowledge because I am a tiny pyro, and I like to have candles. When the wick doesn't evaporate or burn off and leaves little curly cues at the top, that is called mushrooming. Yes, mushrooming, like the little funguses that grow in uh, the forest, those happy decomposers. Uh, that's what that is called. And that happens after the candle burns for an extended period of time. Um, usually it happens on jar candles because the heat is kept inside of the, the modern day jar candles because it's kept inside of the container, warming the wax, releasing the fragrance and making the candle last longer. Now, on modern-day candles, if you leave that wick really long, what happens is, is the flame dances a lot and causes a lot of smoke, which leaves a carbon deposit on the rim of your jar, which is a black buildup. Yes, you can get the black buildup off once the candle is empty or uh, the wax is burned off, but for the most part, if you trim the wicks down, you don't get that. My second point of knowledge. Uh, you talked about if you very carefully blew on the tallow candle wick, you could reignite it. You mean like practical magic, like the one sister? Because that's cool. That's neat. I want to do that. I had always wondered how they did that because it's not a visual effect, it's a practical effect in the movie, and I never could figure it out. But it totally makes sense now that you stop and think about it, that yes, of course the aunts would make tallow candles. They're the aunts. Some knowledge for you in the very early mornings of the hours. <laughs> I'm going to bed so I can listen to the chapters of Northanger Abbey with fresh ears and a heaping bucket of coffee. I hope you have a great day, Heather. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>